So when someone is speaking from their heart, then a channel is created from their heart to their mouth, through your ear to your heart. We can't be the complete selves without all the pieces reunited. We are 12 tribes, not two and a half. And in the comfort, we forget that sometimes there's something worth fighting for. If we were born in a generation where there's the Holocaust and you're living in your comfortable lives in America and you're a young, let's say, male of age that's 20 years old and that's capable to go and fight, wouldn't you, if you're capable, go and fight Nazis and save Jews? Welcome to the In Search of More podcast. I am your host, Ellie Nash. Join me weekly on my quest for more, more from myself and more from this world. We'll see you on the other side. All right, welcome back, Rudy. Thank you for having me again. You're becoming a regular. To many more. <laughs> Last time my foot fell asleep on the couch, we had to cut our interview short. Well, but it's good, the timing's perfect. So you're back in town for um, uh, the We Were Never Lost. We Are Never Lost? We Were Never Lost? We Were Never Lost. We Were Never Lost premiere. You want to talk about that a little bit? For sure. So We Were Never Lost is a documentary series focusing on different regions for each season. Season one is in Africa, season two, Asia, season three, South America. And we're working to bring light to the stories of the tribes of Israel. Now, those that are Jews today, we are 15 million. But besides the 15 million that descend from two and a half tribes, there's nine and a half other tribes that have been split from the Jewish uh, population. And those are the quote unquote lost tribes of Israel. Uh, but we titled the film We Were Never Lost because they've actually always kept their identity. So they actually weren't lost. They were lost to our consciousness. They were the, lost to us. They were lost Do to they us. Do they consider us lost to them? Uh, they consider us not being able to see who they are, but they don't consider us lost because they clearly know that we know who we are. Got you. Yeah. So are, are there different opinions on this, um, the, the lost tribes idea? Meaning, does everyone see it the same way as you do? No. I don't think anyone ever sees anything the same way, but that's also not always a bad thing. Um, I think that if you look at it from a Jewish perspective, in the Torah it says that in the times of Mashiach, the tribes of Israel reunite from the four corners of the earth. So we know from a spiritual place, from the Jewish place, that at some point they come back. From a historic place, we, Do we know, know. Does everyone agree that they were lost? Yes, they agree that after the split of the kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea, that eventually the Assyrians displace the kingdom of Israel 10 tribes included, to the four corners of the earth. Now, it's also- What time period are we referring to? This is right after King Solomon. The children okay. of King Solomon uh, eventually split up the kingdom, and then a bit later, the kingdom of Israel gets destroyed, and these tribes get split to the four corners of the earth. And from that moment on, there's a disconnect. We don't have communication. We don't have relations with them. However, there are some of these Israelites that have come back. For example, Bukharian Jews don't descend from Judea. They descend from the kingdom of Israel, and they've already been brought back. Ethiopian oh, Jews, they don't descend from the kingdom of Judea, and they've already been brought back. So there's a few groups that have already been included in the fold of Amisal. And if you were to say to someone, Ethiopian Jews or Bukharian Jews aren't Jews, you know, today in our generation, hopefully most people will say, you're crazy. However, that wasn't the case if you go back 50, 100 years ago. And it's still not the case for many of these other communities. So when, after the times of King Solomon, when the tribes got split, what happened to the ones... I guess where we came from, the Judean tribes. Yes. Where Judea, basically the tribe of Judah. So the, the kingdom of Judea consisted of the tribe of Judah, primarily the tribe of Binyamin, which was already included within the tribe of Judah, and the tribe of Levi. Levites, which is the tribe that I'm from, from both sides of my family, were spread across the whole land. So within the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judea, you had Levites. So those that descend from Judea are basically Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. And also there are some that were from Shimon because they were early childhood educators and some of them lived there. But primarily were two and a half tribes. And hundreds of years later, after the uh, Assyrians had kicked out the kingdom of Israel, the Roman Empire rises and destroys Judea. And that's where you have the birth of the Jewish people because we descend from a civilization at that point called Judea. We now become known as Judeans or Jews. Understood. So what was different say in the practice of the tribes that we've been a part of. I think on my mom's side, I'm also from the tribe of Levi. From my dad's side, I don't know. Uh, what was different in the way we practiced it and they practiced it, that they recognize us? They, all of them recognize us, right? Yes. So they all, they all recognize us because we've been the mainstream Jewish community. The whole world knows us as being the Jewish people. Um, but you do find some communities, let's say, if you go back 50 years ago without, you know, so much access to internet and things like that, that would have not known 
that we exist because they would have lived in villages and remote areas and they would have had the information to know what's going on. Today at this point with the internet and accessibility and travel, especially the younger generation that is all on social media, they know that we exist. They obviously recognize, they don't deny us. However, we don't know of their existence for the most part. And that's the goal of this project, to have the world wake up and see for themselves who these people are, what their history is, what their experiences have been and still are till this day, and what their aspirations are in order for us to truly reunite. Right. I mean, it is a curious thing that Judaism precedes Islam, precedes Christianity, and there's over a billion each, I believe, of Christians and Muslims, mm -hmm. and there's 15 million known Jews. Yeah. So what do you think the real number is? So besides the 15 million known Jews, um, I would say that there's about 200 to 300 million other Israelites that are descendants of Israel. Not all of them today practice what we call Judaism. Some of them have assimilated. I mean, even most, uh, many of the 15 million uh, Jews don't practice Judaism. I right. mean, you look in America, you have 5.4 million Jews, one of the larger populations of Jews in the world, and you have between 60 to 80% assimilation rates. So even those that are of the 15 million aren't necessarily practicing Judaism necessarily in the right way or even are aware of what Judaism is. So that's the same case for these 200 to 300 million and the estimates can be bigger, right? There could be a population that I have yet to uncover, to discover, to engage with, to, to learn and to grow with. Um, so there are, from what I understand as of now, between 200 to 300 million other descendants of Israel. So within those populations, they also pay attention to marrying, marrying Jews and things like that. I mean, my question is coming from, even though there's assimilation in America amongst the Jews, there yes. is sort of a known record of who is Jewish, who is not Jewish. And when they're marrying Jews, we understand that as long as the mom is Jewish and that goes back in the lineage, then so are the children. Is that recognized also amongst the lost tribes? So I can't say give one answer to hundreds of millions of people because each community has their own experience, their own identity, their own way of practicing. And there are many communities that I've yet to visit. For example, in Asia, we have yet to visit a lot of these communities. So I cannot answer on those. What I can answer is on those in Africa that we've visited. We've been to over eight countries in Africa, right. visiting these different communities, and they all have traditions of only marrying within their community. And if they do marry out of the community, then there's a process in which the, let's say, women would have to go through in order to become part of that community, right? Which is basically what we call as conversion. And what's interesting, for example, in the Lemba, which is the Israelites from Zimbabwe and South Africa and Mozambique, but primarily Zimbabwe and South Africa, is they actually have a tradition that male cannot even convert. So the convert option was only an option available for some women, but they would have to go through a process. And if you marry out without this process, you're actually excommunicated. And then there's additional elements that all these tribes, all these descendants of Israel were constantly persecuted throughout time for being Jews. So even if they would have wanted to go and marry out, they wouldn't even be allowed to. Um, I was just in Ethiopia, you know, about a week and a half ago, and we visited uh, several Jewish communities that still live there. There's between 70,000 to 100,000 Jews that still live in Ethiopia. Many of them, the same family members as those who've already made Aliyah. And there was a, a kid that uh, he was with us, I think he was like 18, 19 years old, and he was showing us around. And at some point we did an interview with him and he asked us to blur his face. And I said, why are you afraid of the anti-Semitism that you would receive? And he's like, although I would get pushed back and I, I would become a target, I'm not afraid of that. And I was like, so what are you afraid of? He's like, my sister married a non-Jew and they don't know that we're Jewish. And if they find out that we're Jewish, they would get a divorce and no longer speak to our family. So I don't want my name associated to anything being Jewish. Oh, so there are realities that they're experiencing, but for the most part, that the are very Jewish realities. general public is very rejecting of these communities in those locations. So how would you sum up the uh, two disagreements between those who think what you're doing is great for the Jewish people and those who think that um, what you're doing is not? I mean, the reality is that we know historically uh, that we have family members that were displaced. We know from the Jewish perspective that we have these family members displaced and that we have a responsibility to bring them back. And at some point they come back. Everyone has learned and heard about the story of the lost tribes, right? Everyone has heard We've that narrative. Heard that. No one has ever really looked into it to a point of being able to bring it back to the consciousness on the mainstream. So I'm no one trying until to, now, until right. what you're doing. I mean, there have been other documentaries and things that have slightly gone into places in Asia and, and talked about the subject, but that didn't really 
uh, catch on with the mainstream. And we're trying to go really in depth. Each episode is on a different uh, country, a different location, a different community to talk about their stories and to bring them to the consciousness of this world. And those, I, I've heard vaguely, I've only spoken to people actually who are in support of this. And sure. it sounds to me yeah. great and amazing. And we'll talk about that as well, that I think it's something worthy of support. But I'm just curious what someone who isn't as on board with this, what they, what they think about. So it's usually coming from some Jews that would be against this. I mean, a non-Jew would hear, oh, they're finding their own brothers and sisters. Great. Sounds I don't amazing. see why they would have any problem with that. But you have to understand that Jews have gone through a lot of trauma. Um, and with that trauma comes a lot of fear of the other, because usually anyone that was an other was coming to kill us to create pogroms and inquisitions and holocausts. So the idea of someone coming from the outside trying to come within is usually something that psychologically, not even consciously, is pushing them away. So you have some Jews that react to this subject. And I would expect, you know, if I, when I heard about this is like, really? There are tribes of Israel out there. We have family members. Let's go find them. Right. And yes, let's do the real research and make sure that they're they're not just making things up. But if they are, let's go out of our way to find them. Is there any benefit to them making it up? Uh, you, some people say that, uh, you know, Israel is an economic stronghold and there are situations of poverty, so they would want to come out. But at the same time, you have in Nigeria, the Igbos that are the richest demographic and most educated demographic in all of Africa. So they don't really need to come to Israel in order to get uh, benefits. And plus, why wouldn't they ask to go somewhere else in America and Europe? Why would they specifically want to go to Israel, a language that they have some of them yet to learn, a society that they have yet to immigrate to? So it's, it's really not coming from a place of, of interest. However, when it comes to Jews having this rejection, it's one from a place of this psychological ingrained idea that's often subconscious that the other is usually your enemy. So this idea of this unknown coming in is something very scary. And also you have many Jews that have lived amongst other societies for a very long time, right? 2000 years of displacement. You have Jews that lived in Arab countries, Jews that lived in European countries, Jews that lived all around the world. And you have a mentality for many Jews, not most, but many that lived amongst European societies that adopted the mentality of superior inferior. Meaning the way Europeans, many of them saw the world, especially the way that they colonized, is that they saw themselves as superior and others were inferior. Thus, this gives us the right to go and take from others. So you think that's where some of this is coming from? Absolutely. There's definitely a superiority uh, complex. And I mean, I, I grew up with it. My dad's side of the family is Ashkenazi. My mom's side of the family is Sephardi. There are moments where family members had told my dad not to marry my mom because she's Sephardic. My grandfather tried to buy uh, a house in, uh, in so Israel. So you're saying Ashkenaz is the European Jews? And they believe they're superior. Ashkenaz to... is a, a Jews that had a European experience. Exactly. They're not European. And the vast majority of them are just like me and you. There are some within well, them. But that was your point. Your point earlier was that the European influence created a superiority complex. To some. So you're saying within your own to some. So you're saying within your own family, your dad, whose lineage is Ashkenaz. Ashkenaz, which had a European experience. Correct. F that his family felt superior to your mom's family. Not every member, but there were there individuals in that family that said, we can't marry those Jews. My grandfather, my mom's father, so the, the Sephardic sign, who was born and raised in Morocco, um, who actually is blonde with blue eyes, surprisingly, wanted to buy land in Israel, was offered the land, everything went well, and then all of a sudden they saw his last name was Sephardic, and they said, wait, you're Sephardic? And he said, yes, it's like you can't buy the land anymore. So this is an experience that many Sephardic and Mizrahi Jews have been going. This does not represent the majority of Israel nor the majority of Ashkenazi Jews. It's very important. However, it is a reality that it's being experienced and we have to talk about it. And there's still members till this day that are very big in different spaces. I'm not going to say names because I don't want to spread Lashon Allah that have come to me and said, come on, those Ethiopian Jews in Israel, they're not actually Jews. And the vast majority of the time, those are Ashkenazi Jews making those statements. And it's not the majority of Ashkenazi Jews, but I'm trying to understand why this is happening, right? Because the point of this is not to point fingers and just to say that there's a problem, it's to understand why. Why are people having this reaction? And in my opinion, there's a very clear correlation with 2000 years of an experience in the diaspora in Eastern Europe, where the mentality was that we are superior and others are inferior, that now that mentality is also applied to other Jews that are Sephardi, Mizrahi, or even more so to Jews that are Bnei Menashe, to Jews that are, had an experience in Africa and into other places. And this is something that we need to talk about. Can and I suggest something that may be a little bit less, um, I don't know, a little bit strong in terms of a uh, negative opinion of others? 
maybe it's in order to be Jewish today, we need to um, really prevent assimilation. We got to be staunch in some way. And I'm sure that's part of your message as well, mm-hmm. which means that if another community comes in, if there is intermarriage, then that's assimilation. Sure. So while the end result may be the same in the way you're saying it, that we're not um, accepting our brothers, the reason they're, they're getting to that place is because we're naturally geared, not from superiority, but just from a place of, hey, how do we prevent assimilation? We don't want to become too much like the other. Not that we think we're better. We just need to protect ourselves. If we didn't have that gene, we would have been you know, married out a long time yeah. ago. There would be no way that we would remain Jewish. Is that, a poss- is that a possible? Well, let's say you have a sibling, and that sibling is, has a life-threatening situation, and that sibling wants to marry out and assimilate. They're both important. There's not one over the other, but the life-threatening situation comes first. And so now we have a reality where there's tribes of Israel, family members that are being persecuted. Some of them are being murdered. For example, in Nigeria, 500 Igbos are killed on average a month. Okay, so there's a situation there that's happening that we need to talk about, that we need to open up, and that we need to help. And then, you know, if we need to figure out situations of intermarriage and this and that, let's look into it. But don't use that as an excuse to not go and help other Jews. Those, oh, sure. I'm saying that's where you, that's where you, but that's that's where not, you come to. But that's not where it's coming from. Because those same people that are saying so much that they care about, you know, preserving and not having assimilation and not allowing intermarriage, aren't going and doing the work to go and find those communities and really figure out if that's happening or not. They're saying that as a sort of pushback to say, I don't really want to dive in. Have you ever persuaded someone who was um, against your viewpoint and after speaking with you and after seeing some of course? So what were they thinking before and what were they thinking after? Well, again, the initial response to this is, I mean, I've been working at this for several right. years now, so I've had you know, thousands of conversations about this. The initial response is usually not even intentional of like pushing, pushing off, like, how could this be? You mean there's there's black Jews, there's Jews in Africa that are not in South Africa and are not those that are in Ethiopia that we know about. There's other Jews. So it, it's not even an intentional reaction where they actually thought about the situation and then responded. Right. It's an immediate response. And then when you talk about the practices that they have, the traditions that they've kept, who they are, how they speak, and when you show them footage, right, you're, you're allowing their eyes to travel through the world and, and, and see it themselves through a screen and you see it for yourself. You know, it completely changes their opinion because now you're showing the proof, which is why it's so important to communicate in the right way and to create what we're doing, a tool, which is a documentary series that opens the eyes and hearts of so many people. I look forward to seeing the, the film this evening. But you contend that some of those people you convinced or many of those people that you convinced were their knee-jerk reaction against it was coming from a superiority complex. Uh, from trauma and from a superiority complex, sometimes one, sometimes the other, and sometimes both. Right. But it's it's definitely not from a place of we need to preserve, so this is what I need to do. It's coming from a place of how could there be an outsider wanting to come in or they're not as good as me and I feel threatened somehow by them coming in. Understood. But when you go to a new community, you hear that they're, they're Jews, you go with some skepticism. For sure. So how do you check? How do you verify that? So in each community that we go, we do plenty of research before, we speak to the leaders before, we understand the history. And of course, as a doctor, are they welcoming? Very yeah. welcoming. Some of them are are How do you skeptical explain what you're of doing? us, right? Some of them have had other people come in and you know take advantage of them. Have had you know Christian missionaries come in and try to proselytize and convert them to Christianity. So to to some of them, the experience for them of an outsider is a negative experience, and it takes time to build up that trust, and it's understandable. Um, but for the most part, very welcoming, especially once they understand who we are and what our motives are. Once we connect to them, it's it's very open. And uh, you, you mentioned some of the vetting process. How does that? Yeah, so, so we do the research about these communities. And then when we're there, we ask a lot of them tough questions. You know, we ask them, you know, what have you been doing for thousands of years? What are you eating? Uh, how have you been marrying each other? What are the practices? What are your goals? What are your amb- ambitions? And there's a community that particularly is, is, in my opinion, maybe more problematic than, than the rest because there's a concept right now that's called emerging Jewish communities. And emerging Jewish communities do not descend from descendants of tribes of Israel. They have become Jewish now. They've converted to Judaism. And there's a phenomenon that's happening in the world of this as well. Within Africa specifically. Within Africa, also within other places in the world. But let's talk about Africa for now. Right. Um, and it's primarily in Uganda, in Kenya, in Cameroon, in Cote d'Ivoire. In those places, you have an emerging Jewish community. 
Now, it really started... Do with, they call themselves an emerging Jewish community? Yes. And they so call, they'll tell you when you speak yes, to them. They, they don't deny that they don't descend from, from Israelites. They are very open with the fact that they converted. It really started in Uganda about 100 years ago, where you had a general uh, that was reached out by the British Empire that was colonizing at the time, and they told him, hey, you're a really good general. Here's this book. This is called the Bible, and we want you to spread Christianity to all the people here. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Before I spread this book, I want to read what this book is about. He opens it, reads the Old Testament, reads the New Testament, and says, I think that the Old Testament is valid and true and the Word of God, and I think the New Testament is a bunch of nonsense, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. So it will not help you, but I will keep this Old Testament. And he starts practicing his understanding. One specific general. One, one individual. He doesn't even know that there are Jews out in the world. He's just practicing what he believes, what he feels is the Word of Hashem, the Word of God, and he practices it based on the mistranslations of their you know, English Bible, right? At some point later on, he meets a Jewish businessman who sees that he has very similar practices. And he's like, you know what you're doing? You're, you're practicing Judaism. Mm -hmm. And I'm a Jew. And this is the first time he realizes that there are other Jews out there. And so this Jew gives him a Tanakh. And now he has the proper translation. And he goes on into creating a movement of thousands of people who are practicing these traditions and these values and seeing themselves as a part of the Jewish people in Israel. Now, of course, at that point, they had not gone through conversions, so halachically, they're not considered Jewish according to rabbinical law. And then Idi Amin takes power. Idi Amin, who at the same time was kidnapping planes and hijacking uh, Israeli citizens and, and Jews as well. And eventually you had the Entebbe mission where the army of Israel comes right. to Uganda, frees those, uh, those kidnapped individuals, and even the brother of Bibi Netanyahu, the current prime minister of Israel, was killed in that mission. And so at the same time that Idi Amin was doing this, he was also persecuting the Abba Yudaya. The name of this community is Abba Yudaya. And he was persecuting them, which shows that he was against Jews, not only those that are in Israel, but even right. those within his own country that identified as Jews themselves, even if rabbinically, halakhically at that point, they were not yet considered Jews. Now, you have that group of thousands that go to about 2,000, whether from being killed or saying, you know what, I'm, I'm Today, not. they're about 2,000 people. No, today, they're much more. So at the time, oh, okay. they go down to 2,000. <laughs> Idi Amin leaves, and today they've grown to, again, 10, 10 15,000, okay? And they're living primarily in uh, Mbale, in uh, Uganda, and in other places. But what's interesting now is that you have rabbis who have since come and contacted those communities, and now you have a conservative community and an orthodox community, <laughs> which is a true sign of if people right. are Jews, <laughs> if you have two communities that don't speak to each okay. other. And so now you have the orthodox community that went through uh, orthodox conversions by Rav Riskin, who's the chief rabbi of Efrat in Israel, one of the cities in Judea and Samaria. And you have a conservative community uh, with Rav Gershon, who's the rabbi there, who was the first ordained uh, African Jewish rabbi that came from Africa, went to uh, the US and went to, through his conversion and became a rabbi, and then eventually came back and he's the leader of that community there. Now, so those Jews are not recognized by the Orthodox Jews. So the rabbinate doesn't recognize either, because even if you do an Orthodox conversion, it has to be an Orthodox conversion under what the rabbinate uh, approves to be the Orthodox rabbis that can do conversions. However, halakhically, <laughs> If you do an Orthodox conversion, regardless of the rabbinate, because that comes much later with the creation of the state of Israel, they're halakhically Jewish. So the Orthodox community is halakhically Jewish. The conservative community is not considered halakhically Jewish. In other words, according to Jewish law, they're considered Jews. According to Israel, they're well, not to be honest, it, it, there's there's a huge mess because according to the conservative Jewish community, they preserve halakha and their conversions are valid, and to the Orthodox community, they're not. So it's not up to me to say who's Jewish or not. I'm just realizing the current situation and the balagan that exists. But what I can say is that right now we're talking about a group of 10, 15,000, 20,000, in a few years from now, 30,000, a few years from now, 50,000, a few years from now, 100,000, millions. And it's not just happening in Uganda, it's happening in Kenya, this is happening in Cameroon, this is happening in many places. And if the Jewish people don't come here now and deal with the situation and fix it, we're gonna have a huge amount of people that are identifying as Jews and a big balagan that's happening. So we need to. Come right, you're in. saying we need to deal with it anyway. We need we... to deal with this. We need to do it properly. We Even need to those be who welcoming. disagree with you forcefully, you're saying it still needs to be dealt with. I'm saying it? it needs to be done properly. And people who would disagree would say we need to do it properly. And I agree, but we need to address the situation. We can't ignore it. And there are issues again, like I said, in in some of the individuals in Uganda. Uh, there is a woman. I'm not going to say her name. That I was asking. You know, you've been third generation born Jewish. That's how you identify. That's how you've seen your entire life. Your grandparents had converted and your parents were born and you were born. That's, that's all you know. 
Let me ask you something. Do you feel like you're more Jewish, more part of the nation of Israel, or more part of Uganda? And she says, I'm both. And I says, no, 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 you, you can't escape <laughs> this. You have to choose one. I'm both. I'm like, okay, what if you're watching the Olympics and there's Team Israel versus Team Uganda? Which one are you supporting? It's like, I'd support both. I'm like, no, no, there's the final gold medal <laughs> championship, World Cup, the final thing, and you have to choose one. Which one are you choosing? Both. I'm like, okay, I'm going to ask you a question that you can't escape this time. Let's say tomorrow there's a war between Israel and Uganda, which is not that crazy. Not too long ago, the president of uh, Uganda was hijacking planes and holding Israelis as captives. Let's say there's a war tomorrow, chas v'shalom, between Israel and Uganda, and you have to send your 18-year-old son to war. Is he killing Jews or is he killing Ugandans? What do you think she said? I think, I think she said Israel. She'll send Israel. She said Part of the Israeli army. She said he's fighting for Uganda. Oh, really? Now, this is not all and nor the majority, but this is also some truth that is happening there that we need to break down. That some so of them... To that, you, that was a sign that... To me, this is a sign that you're saying you're not part of Am Yisrael. I got it. Because when you convert, the whole point of converting is adopting the identity, the culture, the history, the value system, the land. This is now your family. And if you cannot answer when you're asked the tough questions in the moment to prove if this is your family or not, it shows what you consider to be your family, which is fine. Doesn't make her my enemy. Right. Doesn't make her anything. But we have to be clear as to what it means to convert to Judaism. You're not right. just you saying, just put her under fire to say what is your what is your identity. When you're you converting to Judaism, you're not just saying I believe in the same things that you believe and I practice the same thing you practice. You're saying I have the same responsibility and purpose as your people because I am your people and you are my family. So this is also a conversation we need to open up of. What does it truly mean to convert? It's not just making the checks and, and going through tests and passing the test and practicing the same thing. It's really seeing yourself as a part of the nation of Israel. It's, it's a grafting system within a nation, within a civilization, within a tribe. It's not just converting and practicing and believing in the same religion. And, and what would you say to the many Jews who identify today as Jews and you know through the lineage, not through conversion, Correct. and they don't support or don't identify with the land of Israel? So... On that situation, they're still Jews no matter what they do. But you're going to have Rabbi Harry coming in soon, and he has very powerful things to say about that. And he says, there's nothing that anyone can do that's born Jewish that can remove their Jewish identity. Doesn't matter if they're practicing Buddhism, doesn't matter if they don't believe in God, doesn't matter if they intermarry. However, if you have such a disconnect from understanding who you are, it is most likely the case that your children will not be Jewish. And so someone who's born to a Jewish family is Jewish, no matter what they say, even if they don't recognize that they're part of this family. I mean, you have children. If, let's say, chas v'shalom, your children said, I no longer want to believe. They're still your children. It doesn't matter what they do. They'll always be your children. So it's the same thing. People that were born Jewish will always be your family, whether they realize that or not, whether they practice that or not. However, if they don't have that kind of lifestyle, mentality, vision, perspective of understanding who they are, it is most likely the case that they will assimilate, which is what we're seeing here in America. That's a good answer. Now to um, uh, this this particular group you mentioned, you documented in the... Yes, we went to Uganda, okay. we documented. And again, I don't want anyone to take what I'm saying as this is the majority of the answers of the people there. It is not, quite the contrary. But it is something that is happening and there are problems. And this is just to show you the vetting process. When we go in, we ask them tough questions. We challenge them. We really want to see what is true, what isn't true. Um, and we, we follow through. Uh, Oh, amongst your team, there's a rabbi who understands these subjects really well, or you're the resident expert? Uh, there's several rabbis that we are in touch with, that we communicate, that we have as advisors, uh, including Rabbi Harry, which I mentioned before, oh, uh, and many other rabbis that you know, give us directions when we need help on certain questions. Fascinating. Where, where do you, what, what's the end goal here? What would you like to see being created in the world as a result of the We Were Never Lost docuseries? On a, on a macro level of really the end goal, it's Mashiach, this reality where we achieve oneness in this world. We become a functioning ecosystem, a functioning body where all the nations fulfill their potential and are able to really work together. On a short-term level uh, with this project, I want this generation that was born, us, that are here today in history, that we are the last generation to have been born without knowing who our brothers and sisters are. I want that consciousness to be brought back. I want them to be known for who they are. And from there, we can see. Maybe, you know, there's, there's a process of all these Jewish communities united. Maybe there's a process of allowing many of them to come back home to Israel if they want to. If they're Jews, they should be allowed to come back to Israel like anyone else. So right now they are not. 
Right now, they're definitely not. So to you, if, if your docuseries resulted in Israel recognizing every one of the tribes that you recognize as Jewish, they do too, and they're now accepted into the land of Israel, that's a success for you. Let me tell you something. Originally, this project started from a place of doing the right thing, of seeing family members of mine suffering and not recognized and not known, and realizing if the situation was reversed and they had come home to Israel first and my family was still suffering, I would expect them to come home. After several years of doing this, there's an, an additional thing that developed that I've realized, that we cannot be ourselves without them. Imagine you have a glass vase, and you take this vase and you throw it on the floor. It smashes into a bunch of different pieces. Some are bigger, some are smaller, some are tiny, some mm -hmm. are huge. And in order to have the full vase again, you need all the pieces. Now, Israel, thousands of years ago, was destroyed. We were scattered. You have Ashkenazim, you have Sfaradim, Mizrachim, Bet Yisrael, Bnei Menashe, all these different communities that went in different places. We brought back a huge piece, the Ashkenazim. We brought back a huge piece, the Sfaradim. We brought back a huge piece, the Mizrachim. We brought back half of the Ethiopians. We brought back a portion of the Bnei Menashe. We brought back small individuals from here and there. But there's still so many other pieces that are missing. We can never be the fullest expression of who we are without all the tribes reunited. Now, that doesn't mean every individual Jew being back in Israel, but every community has to have their place back within the whole image. And you know, if you have a puzzle piece, right? Puzzle pieces on the floor and you want to create a puzzle, you need all the pieces. If you're missing yeah. half of the board or the majority of the board, you won't even know if you have a piece where it fits. So if you look in Israel, we're very dysfunctional. One is going to the right, one is going to the left. We want to be religious, we want to be secular, we want to be this, we want to be that. And that's because there's so many elements of the image that are missing for us to even comprehend what our potential is. And that's something that I've realized that although they lost elements of things, like for example, many of them lost actual Sefer Torah, they only had oral traditions. Some of them kept it, some of them didn't. We also lost many things that they kept on. And the real answer to find who we are is to include all the puzzle pieces together, to put them together so it fits, and then to see the image that we're supposed to create into this world. You mentioned Rabbi Harry in a uh, offline conversation with him. He, he's a descendant of the, the Gona Vilna. Correct. And he mentioned to me that the Gona Vilna prophesied that in order for, who gets to speak and it's called a prophecy. That's pretty cool, right? The Gona Vilna said, prophesied, that in order for Messiah to come, all the lost tribes, of Israel, all the tribes of Israel have to come, come back together. So you see this as an extension of that. Absolutely. I mean, it even says it in the Torah. It says in the times of Mashiach, the tribes of Israel reunite from the four corners of the earth. Now, if the answer we want to get to is Mashiach, right? It basically says answer equals equation. If you flip it, equation equals answer. Bring the tribes of Israel from the four corners of the earth, and then you get to Mashiach. And it's not they come and then you have Mashiach. It's they come back and then we can be ourselves. And we can't be ourselves until they come back. We can be a, a version of ourselves, a portion of ourselves, a fragment, a fraction of ourselves. We can't be the complete selves without all the pieces reunited. We are 12 tribes, not two and a half. So those of us who have no say over Israel policy, what can we do to support this? Uh, it starts by raising awareness. Uh, if we understand the way the Israeli government works, um, it's a parliamentary system that uh, focuses on many small parties uniting together in order to have the majority of the seats in the Knesset. And once you have this majority of the seats, you can then go and become prime minister for the largest party. However, at any moment, if one of the parties remove their seats, then they don't have a majority and there's a follow the coalition, then there's a new election the next day, which is why Israel in the past few years has gone through four or five elections. Right? This is not normal, but this is because the coalition is broken apart. So a prime minister coming into power knows that he or she may have a very short time in power. It might be two weeks, it might be two months, it might be a year. It hasn't been four years in a very long time. So clearly there's a short period of time where they're in power. Now, what they focus on with that is realizing I have a very small bit of time, and in that time, my energy, my policy, my investments will be in policies that can give me a return, that with that return, I can go to the next election and say, this is what I did. Now, if nobody knows, nobody cares. And since nobody knows about these tribes of Israel, nobody cares, and there's no incentive, even if the government knows about it, which they do, to do anything because there's no return. Now, if we make this a public issue, if we make this a social revolution of our generation saying, we want this, politicians will say, of course we're going to do this. You give us our votes, of course we're going to take this policy. So it's not that the Israeli government is against this idea. It's understanding the way that it functions. It functions by wanting to maintain power, and it's not about hating the players, right? It's about understanding that we need to change the game. And that's a whole other conversation that we, that 
we should have as a generation of what kind of government structure do we need in order for our people to function? Because clearly what we have is not functioning. So to understand how the equation works with the government, we need to make this a social issue. So what can people do? Raise awareness. Make this something that we talk about in our generation. Make this something that we eventually get to the conclusion of, which is bring all of our family back together. How did it happen with Ethiopia that Israel was willing to accept them? So there's a few things that happened. First of all, um, around the late 70s, which is the moments where they started speaking about them, there was something else that occurred. There was the UN uh, plan or UN um, uh, conference that passed a resolution saying that Zionism was racism. It was a huge issue at the time. And many of the Ethiopian leaders that we've engaged, that we spoke to said, we do not think it's a coincidence that the moment that the United Nations calls out the Jewish people in Israel for being racist, not having to do with this, but just saying that it's racist because they try to attach us to all the bad things in the world. Um, the moment that this happens, all of a sudden, they're open to the idea of bringing back Ethiopian Jews. And they believe that the reason for why they were brought back was as a tool to say, look, we're not racist. How could we be racist? We have black Jews. And so that's the uncomfortable, ugly truth as to one of the bigger reasons as to why the Ethiopian Jews were brought back. After that situation was happening, you have Rabbi Vadi Yosef, who was a tzaddik, who helped get recognition for this community, was the chief rabbi of Israel, who says the Ethiopian Jews are Jews. He did research. He found rabbinical writings of a big rabbi in Egypt that had relations with Ethiopian Jews and had talked about there being a Jewish community and used this to come to the conclusion that clearly there's a Jewish community there. And then they opened the doors. Now, 100,000 So now Jews, they're recognized by everyone. Half of them. Yes. They brought half and then they stopped. There's still many other Israelites, Jews, living in Ethiopia. We just And they will not allow Ethiopia. them. They only allow a handful back in. I mean, let me, let me tell you, we got to Gonda, which is one of these refugee camp cities of Jews living in mud huts with Mizuzot on the mud huts in poverty, where you have about 3,000 kids that should be starting first grade every year. Only 300 Jewish kids start out of the 300 kids, and only three finish 12th grade out of the 3,000. So this is just to understand the poverty levels that they face due to the anti-Semitism, due to the fact that kids have to leave and work for their families, they can't continue their education, due to the fact that they give tests on Friday night and on Saturday on Shabbat and they don't want to break uh, Shabbat. You know, I mean, you had one of the kids that graduated 12th grade and he said, I'm Shomel Shabbat, I had no other choice but to take tests on, uh, on Shabbat. So I would use a special pen on Shabbat to sh remind me that this is the special Shabbat pen because I have no other choice because I have to make it out here to save right. my family. And this is a matter of life and death. So you have situations like that. We get to Gondal, there's 14,000 Jews living in a refugee camp. Like we're witnessing in our lifetime, Jewish refugee camps of Jews that have already been recognized. I'm not talking about the ones that we don't know about, right? But there's other situations there. The ones that we are already supposed to be aware of. And these are the same families that are already living in Israel. So we get there, we got there at night and there's a, there's a kid there who's 23 years old who is about to make Aliyah tomorrow. There's a group of 18 that got approved finally to make Aliyah. He's been waiting 23 years of his life in a refugee camp to finally come home. And he's not An 18 happy. year old waiting 23 years? No, he's 23 years old. 23 waiting He's 23 years, years okay. old, he's been waiting Sorry. 23 years. I flipped it. Um, and so he's been waiting 23 years and we're with him and he's, he's not so happy. And I'm asking him why, he's like, I, I can't really show you my expression of, of joy of being able to finally come back to my home but I'm the only member of my family that's allowed to go. Little my mom is staying, things. my sister is staying, right. my brothers are staying, and I leave tomorrow, and we were with him and his final goodbye with his friends, tying his shoes in the morning, closing his suitcase, having his last injara meal with his family, and he tells us, he's like, you know, my mom, 26 years she's been in this refugee camp, 23 years ago I was wow. born, so three years before she was in this refugee camp, 26 years ago my father, my grandfather made Aliyah, and was on one of the last flights back to Israel. So for 26 years, my mother hasn't seen her father. I've never gotten to meet my grandfather. And tomorrow I moved to Israel, but last week he died. And so he was never able to see his grandfather and her daughter, his mother was never able to see uh, the grandfather, the father of, of the mother. So these are realities that are happening. And you know, when you go there, it's, it's heartbreaking. And after all the years of doing this, you really can't understand what's happening in Ethiopia and these places until you go yourself, which is why it's so important to show the world through this documentary. How does that make any sense according to Israel's law of return? Doesn't a Jew have so, a right so to So they back? just stopped. They said, we brought all the Jews, that's it, we're done. And they just decided to stop when there's many others because you had many who couldn't escape through Sudan. There was, I mean, the way that they made Aliyah, if anyone really looks into it, they didn't just 
come and hey, go to the airport, everything's fine. They had to trek weeks to go through Sudan. Many of them died on the way to eventually get deported on these uh, planes that took them back to Israel. So there was a lot of struggles that they needed to go. And there were many Jews in villages that didn't know about this or people that had children that couldn't make that voyage or someone that was sick that they couldn't go or in a situation that they couldn't leave. You had so many that were still there and that didn't know. And now they want to come home to Israel. And these are really the same families as those that are there. And there's other communities as well that are a bit more complicated in, in Ethiopia. You have the Falashmura, which are the Jews that converted to Christianity and have now come back to Judaism. But they were always treated by the Christians as the Jews, even while they had converted to Christianity. We went to one of these communities in a, in a, in a place called Lalibela. And there's like one of the Jews there that has his eye gouged out because he was beat up by non-Jews. They're always called... Uh, all these names, Buddha, and which means like someone who's unclean and evil eye, someone who you can't touch and you can't be around. Uh, that's how they're always treated. And there was a girl who had a huge Magin David brand on her on her wrist, on her hand right here. Like a tattoo? Like almost like a tattoo, a huge brand, like a burn. Oh, burn. And I asked her, you know, why do you, why do you have that? And she said, you know, so many of my my friends are constantly afraid of being Jewish, and we get persecuted for being Jewish. And, and called names and beat up and made fun of and we lose jobs and all these things. And I was tired of it. I was tired of Jews being afraid of who they are. And I was tired of people trying to shame me for who I am. I decided to wear it on my wrist so everyone knows right away. And she said, the moment I did that, everyone stopped messing with me. So I think that there is a correlation having, you know, lived 29 years of this life and Bozat Hashem many more years to go, that there is a correlation that when you're afraid of who you are, attacks go up and when you become strong, and proud of who you are, it's like, okay, you're Jewish. It's almost as if there's like a something within anti-Semites that are like, just be yourself. Just wake up. Just act right. Just do what you're supposed to do. And they're trying to shake us. And the moment that we like wake up and do it, it's like, okay, fine. You're good. Right. I mentioned on a previous discussion, that's how I started uh, wearing a yarmulke today is when I saw some of the anti-Semitism and certain people saying we should be more quiet. I said, I got to wear a big, bright white one. Good. So <laughs> more proud. But it's good. The timing is right. I'm going to Europe next month. So. I'll, uh, I'll wear it proudly. Should we talk about uh, our first conversation and um, the uh, support um, I offered the, the cause and some of perhaps your resistance to it and have a good, good conversation around uh, crowdfunding? Let's do it. Let's do it. So, uh, well, first of all, maybe introduce what is crowdfunding and why you're so connected to it and how you've helped so many people with it. Yes. So, you know, if you go before, you know, Prior to the internet or mail order, these ways of fundraising, the way an organization supported itself was going door to door, essentially. It's not economical to go door to door with someone for a $50 donation, a $100 donation. So what ended up happening is organizations went to several large supporters, and they're the ones who footed the bill. The exception would be perhaps a synagogue where you can put a basket in some way, you're bringing everyone together, some sort of communal style um, fundraiser where you say, okay, there's a basket going around the room. Let's throw uh, money in. Now with the internet, a lot has changed. But the fundamentals for many organizations has not changed the way they think about it. So crowdfunding is essentially using the internet, using technology as a tool to allow for that kind of fundraising. And as someone who's approached regularly by charities for donations, to me, I want to see that the organization is leveraging crowdfunding because a, it's a much it's an extremely powerful to a tool it's much more reliable if an organization got fifty thousand dollars from 500 different people last year the chances that they get that same fifty thousand next year is much higher than if they got it from one person so i've been a big proponent of um of this kind of support so for example for a cause like yours prior to the internet obviously it wouldn't completely be possible because you're filming media but conceptually if the internet wasn't there what you would do is go door to door to several people and say, hey, can you support, can you support this cause? Because you couldn't take the time to have a meeting with someone and they give you a $50 check or a $100 check. So you're just going after the people who can give you the, let's say the number is five or 10,000 and up, that that would be economical for all of the back and forth that it would take uh, to get a, do um, a donation. So when we spoke the first time, I suggested that you look at this tool. I mean, you obviously have a big social media platform, so it's easier for you than some, but it also is, um, it's new. It's new for, uh, for many organizations. It's different because they were taught in that way. Go, for the, go after the, uh, the people who have the money to get the money. And I've seen time and time again with many organizations 
that using the larger donations as a way to leverage the crowd and fundraise in that way increases both. It increases the large support because from larger donors, they understand that, okay, this project actually has some support. So if, there, if there's any cause and you say, hey, I was able to, 500 people have donated to this cause. Well, obviously people care. Okay, so they weren't able to give the exact amount that's necessary for the budget. Great, so um, a donor who's able to will, will push it over the edge. And then for many smaller donors, they're saying, okay, this is, what's the budget for your film? Let's say a million dollars, right? So you say, what's, what do my $50 do? How is it really going to help you? But when you actually use the power of technology and you see what that does, yeah, $50, $50 and watch, watch the tickers go. Here's 500 people who gave $50. Look where the numbers are now. And you keep doing that and it creates a momentum around whatever it is uh, someone doing. So for these many reasons, I've always supported crowdfunding. I've been involved with two uh, campaigns. Actually, this was the third year uh, for Chabad, but the last two years were over $50 million that were raised using the website charity.com. And even that only came after, over the last 10 years, almost any cause I supported, I wanted to know, are you guys leveraging crowdfunding? Are you guys doing everything you could to get those donors on board? And one other thing that it does as well is, let me ask you this. Someone's watching you on Instagram and they see what you're doing and they say, okay, I'm going to donate $36. Six months later, when you release some footage, when you release a video, are they more likely to watch because of that $36 donation? Of course. That's it. Those who pay, pay attention. And that's another thing also is that you're out there getting support, but now you're also getting, you're also getting support financially, but you're also getting support from them because they're bought in in some way. They're connected even if they, they don't want to. I'm uh, friendly with uh, Rabbi Shays Tab, who has an organization called Soul Words, and he and I have had several conversations over the years about his own crowdfunding, which he was very resistant to when I started speaking to him. And I made the same point to him, and he's found it as well, is that if someone gives him even $18 for his annual campaign, when he sends a video with a Torah class, they're more likely to click on it if they also gave him $18, for sure. And that's... Okay, so th we gave the background on crowdfunding. <laughs> yeah. So that's the background on crowdfunding and why I'm uh, passionate about it. So when we spoke about your cause, I said, I'm happy to support, but I'd like you to do it in the form of a crowdfunding campaign. Like, I want to do the mitzvah, but I want many other people to do the mitzvah. To jump on board. And for all the reasons I said, right? For all the reasons I said, first of all, why shouldn't the amount I give also get you at least that much or more? I also mentioned that very often it inspires other larger donors, larger gifts as well. Right, so the amount I had uh, offered the organization was fifty thousand dollars. You can use that to go to another donor and say, "Hey, he's willing to give me fifty thousand. If I get fifty thousand, would you be willing to give me twenty-five or fifty or a hundred if I can do the same thing?" So it actually inspires many more gifts mm -hmm. than just the multiplication is more than times two. I found that these gifts can be multiplied sometimes times five, times ten. But you're resistant. Can you uh, share your? Well. You know, we had already raised through crowdfunding. I'm not, I wasn't re resistant against it. We had already raised about half a million dollars, um, whether it's like from one individual donor that gave 150K when they heard about the project or smaller donations of $5, $10, 18, 36, and so on. So we've already raised from, I think, over 700 different individuals money. And when I was reaching out to you, it was more, I'm in and out of Africa. I don't really have the time to do another crowdfunding campaign. Mm -hmm. I just need help to fuel this project, <laughs> to get these Jews and to help them. Um, but in the end, you know, we're doing this campaign um, and we're very excited about it and we're hoping that it's going to result in many things. And simultaneously, there's a an organization called Cause Match that reached out to us and said, hey, we want to do this at the same time. So when you see these patterns falling all together, it's like, okay, let's <laughs> <the> Hashem <laughs> right. surrender. Yeah, let's, uh, let's see what happens. Yeah. yeah, I think it'll be beautiful. And uh, who knows, maybe... Um, Someone on our team or your team can use this little section to cut it up and share with the audience. And for sure, hopefully, in, uh, in, in hearing us talk, they'll be inspired to support our brothers um, everywhere in the world. Can you share a little bit about what happened in um, Nigeria? Yeah. That experience? I know you were so, arrested. For sure. So, um, out of the countries that we needed to go to in Africa, there's Nigeria, Uganda, Tanzania, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Madagascar. We also added Ivory Coast in the end and Ethiopia. And we've been to all of those countries and we started with Nigeria knowing that this was 
relatively the most dangerous country out of the list that we had. In Nigeria, you have Boko Haram. You have uh, yeah. kidnappings left and right. Uh, the government isn't so But there friendly. are a lot of Jews there. Uh, you or have some Jews. Ibos, which are the right, you had mentioned earlier in the conversation. And you have Israelis that live there and you know do business there. You have really Israelis and Jews doing business everywhere, expat communities. And they're treated fine. They have no issues. They're you know here for business, nothing political. All is good. Uh, but you have a reality in Nigeria that is really a, it's made up country. It's not a it's not a country that has existed for thousands of years. It's a country the British created, and they brought all these ethnic groups together and labeled this country Nigeria. The economic force were the Igbos. They are living on the land where there's the most oil. Uh, they were always the most educated. They were always the most successful with business and trade. And the larger population is the House of Fulani, which are mostly Muslim. And so when you have a democracy that you create where the person power is from the majority population, which ends up a lot of times being from this community that is maybe the majority in terms of population, but not necessarily the economic power, which is now the minority, then you have like a friction from political power and economic power fighting each other, which is exactly what the British designed it to be because it's always been divide and conquer, right? That's what they did between Israelis and Palestinians. That's what they did between Pakistan uh, and India. That's what they did in Afghanistan. Um, that's what they did in Nigeria. And so we have remnants of this British colonial tool of divide and conquer that still exists today where the Igbos are still being persecuted. Uh, in 1967, you had 3 million Igbos exterminated and killed. Uh, a lot of them starved by the Nigerian government in a civil war that happened there. Uh, and there's a lot of things happening, but we knew that this wasn't the safest place to go. The Igbos are what? They're Jewish, non-Jewish mix? So the Igbos have a very ancient, very detailed uh, narrative and history that has been passed on orally that they descend uh, primarily, but also others, from the tribe of God, G-A-D. Uh, the way in which they talk about their narrative. So there were millions killed? Uh, there were 3 million killed. Wow. Today, there are about 50 million Igbos. Now, the majority of those Igbos... Oh, are, so we get to the $200 million, $200 million number that you mentioned. A lot of them are Igbos. Million, it includes 50 million Igbos. It includes 50 million Pashtuns. It includes uh, 100,000 Lemba. It includes the 100,000 Ethiopian Jews. It includes the Bnei Menashe, the Betay It includes all these communities. Understood. The Bnei Nusim also, Jews that descend from Sephardic Jews that were converted to Christianity that are now coming back to their identity. Now, not all, like I said before, not all the, that number is practicing Judaism. You have the majority of the Igbos that were forced to convert to Christianity. And today, although the majority identify as Israelites, they still practice a form of Christianity. But you have about a 30,000 group that has refused to adopt Christianity by force or has come back to Judaism and are practicing full rabbinic Torah Judaism as me and you know. In fact, they're Orthodox, they're very observant, they're Shomel Shabbat, Shomel Kashut on every little detail. They, a lot of them speak Hebrew already. And so you have communities that exist. There's nuances to this subject. Um, the Igbos have been traditionally persecuted. I mean, the vast majority that were slaves that were taken from Nigeria were from Igbo origin. 20% of the transatlantic slave trade come from the Igbos. So it's not just something that's happening now. It's been happening for a very long time. And they're always considered the ones that control the media, the ones that control the economy, the ones that own all the real estate, the ones that are the doctors and the lawyers and all the same things, the same tropes that you hear being told about other Jews, they are experiencing <laughs> the same thing. Which again, you know, if you add one, two, three, four together, you start to see a pattern here. You know, it's not just because of this that that makes them Jewish. But when you have the narrative, when you have they, they do circumcision, when they have laws of nida, when they've passed on these traditions, when they have like monotheistic, panentheistic views of the way the world works that is very Jewish, when they know exactly where in Israel they were living and how they came and in what years they came, when you have all these things together, you start to say, like Rabbi Harry says, there's no smoke without a fire. And there's clearly a lot of smoke here. So there must be a big fire that we have to uncover. And so a little bit later, I'll be sitting with um, Shaman Omar, who's from the uh, Pashun tribe. So correct. I'll ask him some of these ask questions. Him. He's an <laughs> amazing guy. And so yeah. lucky to have him in your life. Um, so when it comes to the, the, the Nigerian chapter on, on the Igbos, we knew coming into Nigeria, it was going to be a dangerous situation. However, we were not here to do anything politically. Uh, we're here purely to talk about the Jewish story of the Igbo population and their traditions and their and their history and their aspirations. And we were focusing primarily on the 30,000 that practice Torah Judaism. Like we're not going all around the country. We're going to the small little groups uh, that are practicing Torah the way that we know. And so we get there. We had done research before. We had security hired. We spoke to security experts. 
We never posted exactly where we were. If we posted, it was after we left the place. There were certain areas we knew we couldn't go to, so we had to take them off the itinerary. So it's not like we went in blind. We knew exactly what we were doing. And, you know, a lot of people are like, why would you risk your life? And now we're, we're planning, we have ideas of, of going back, you know, to complete the, the episode. And so people are like, how could you go back there? And I, I guess they just don't understand where we're coming from. We're not What's doing this for fun, right? If we were born in a generation where there's the Holocaust and you're living in your comfortable lives in America and you're a young, let's say, male of age that's 20 years old and that's capable to go and fight, wouldn't you, if you're capable, go and fight Nazis and save Jews? And if you were caught by the Nazis and imprisoned for three weeks like we were, wouldn't you go right back and go and fight more and go and save more Jews? At least I would. So this is not from a place of we're there for, for fun, we're there for a thrill. We're there to save the lives of our brothers and sisters. And it doesn't matter how many times I will get obstacles in front of me, I will still overcome those obstacles and I will still complete this mission until it's done. Mm -hmm. So that's the energy that we're coming into this. Um, we got to, um, to Nigeria. We had taken a flight from Israel to Istanbul, Istanbul to Lagos, Lagos to Asaba. And then from Asaba, we took a drive to Ogidi. So it was a huge uh, journey to eventually get there. Uh, once we got to, Asab, to to Ogidi, it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. We brought them a Sefer Torah that even that was a miracle and how we got a gift last minute of a Sefer Torah to bring to this Amazing. community. And they were dancing with it. Torah temima, Torah tadonai temima. <laughs> Just like such a beautiful rejoicing song of appreciating the Sefer Torah gift that they got. You know, there were moments where I was like, you know, we want to get footage in the market to see the life. You need to take us. And they said, you know, the way you remind me of this, uh, of what you're asking was the way that Moshe and Bamidbar was talking, like you know, everything <laughs> that they see has to do with Hashem and Torah. It's just fascinating. And you, you feel so so full in your heart that you're with your, your family members and, and they see you as like, you are our brothers and sisters that for thousands of years we've been disconnected from and finally we get to see you again. So it was one of the most beautiful moving experiences I've ever had. Unfortunately, on the end of the second day there, uh, there's a bunch of third-party media sites, you know, spreading propaganda about us, saying that we're Mossad agents, that we've brought this secret bomb called a Sefer Torah, which is a Bible scroll. Maybe it's a spiritual bomb, definitely not a physical <laughs> one. And they brought this, like, bomb, and they're here to attack the Nigerian government. And we're reading this, like, as it's coming out, and we're like, this is ridiculous. Like, I mean, I have a lot of followers on social media. People can see who I am. I'm always coming with a message of peace and unity, never of attacking. I don't have anything against the Nigerian government. I'm only here to tell about the stories. And I mean, there's the pitch deck, there's the website, there's all the descriptions about our project. Right. We're not just coming to Nigeria, it's all around the world and starting with Africa. So in our minds, everything's gonna be okay. You know, let's make a public post that we're not here for any political mission, no diplomatic movement, nothing. We're here purely to talk about the story of the tribes of Israel and the experience of Jews in Nigeria. We go to sleep thinking that everything's okay. Uh, wake up at 7 in the morning, start to pack. We needed to leave at 7.45 to pray shakharit with the Jewish community. Uh, we're packing our stuff. I'm putting some protein bars, a change of clothes, my tefillin, a water bottle. And 7.30, we get a phone call from the lobby saying, come downstairs with your passports and phones. The police are here. Oh, wow. How yep. many were you? We were three. Me, David, and Noam. And so we get that call. And uh, we're like, okay. I mean, they want to ask questions. We have nothing to hide. We're not guilty of anything. We're not going to come at this situation with fear. You know, if someone comes and knocks at your door and you didn't do anything wrong, you're not going to initially feel fear. You'll feel fear if you know you did something wrong for the most part or if you have past trauma of other things that have happened. So anyways, we, we go downstairs. It's not the police. It's 15 armed gun militants with black ski masks with guns, ironically, Tavols, which is an Israeli gun, pointing at us and saying, give us your passports and your phones. Now, immediately, you know, we don't really have an option but to comply. I mean, we're surrounded. Uh, even if we want to Who did you think they were? They showed us an ID and they said, we're the DSS, we're the Nigerian FBI uh, Shin Bet, you know, telling us basically the equivalence of the countries that we could relate to, to what they were. They give us their IDs. They take our passports and phones. They said, you have to come with us. We're going to question you for about two, three hours to make sure all, all is good here. And then we'll bring you back. And we're like, listen, it's Friday. We have to film the preparations of Shabbat. We have to film all sorts of stuff to show the world actually how they live their Jewish lives. We can come with you. It's the morning. We'll miss Shacharit, but we need to be brought back because we have work to do. And there's only a limited amount of time. We're not going to be here next Shabbat. We're in a different community. Don't worry. It'll take two, three hours. All will be good. They take us outside. There are three vans waiting for us. They load us each into a different van. The matriarch of the Jewish community had heard 
that they had come for us. So she came, Ima Lisbon, to be at the hotel where they were taking us. And they said, we don't need you. She's like, no, I'm not leaving them until they are until free. So I'm coming with. And she ends up coming with us. And she ends up going to jail with us, actually. Oh, it's wow. held in a separate cell where the women are held and stayed nine days extra after we were released. We had to pay for her lawyer, for the bail, to help everything. We sent money to buy a phone for one of the kids that didn't have means of communication. We did everything to help her get out. But just to show that she wasn't being taken, but she demanded to come with us and was even longer in prison than we were because she said, I'm not going to let them go there under my responsibility. We get taken about 45 minutes away to this um, government facility. It's not a prison. It's just some like interrogation facility. And they have us in this holding room and they start taking us one at a time to interrogation and they ask us questions and I can see the good cop, the bad cop. The one brings me a water bottle, one slams the, the folder with the paper on the table. There's like some sort of window where there's people on the outside looking. There are different rooms. Where You're they still all us. separate. Each one of us separately they would take. And, you know, it's kind of funny that I know what this tactic is that you're using. I mean, anyone who's seen a movie, let alone me who served, you know, in the army, not that I was ever in interrogation, but, you know, when, when you're a soldier, you, you, you understand how other people with authority and guns work and function and what their objectives are and when they're acting and when they're not acting, or at least you're, you're conscious of, of trying to determine what that is. And so I'm, I'm realizing they're, they're, they're trying to like pressure me into giving them information that I don't have. And they had an obsession. I was 27 at the time. Um, Noam was also 27 and David was um, 47. So David, our team member, who's the producer in charge of the logistics, the hotels, the, the planning and a lot of the things, he's 20 years older than me. And it's fine. We've had an amazing relationship for many years. He's a brother to me. And they just can't wrap their head around why someone who's 20 years younger is the team leader. And they think that we're lying. They're, they're convinced that we're lying and that actually David is the team leader and I'm like taking one for the team and pretending to be the team leader. And so they're like, are you sure the team leader? Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? In, out of interrogation, in, out. And at some point they bring me back and they slam the, the, the folder with the papers, the manila folder on, on the table and they say, you could admit it already. We have the proof. David admitted that he's the team leader. <laughs> and I look at them and I'm like trying to hold back uh, uh, from laughing and I'm kind of smiling. I'm like, you know, these interrogation tactics you probably learned them from Israelis. Let me give you a hint. It doesn't work against Israelis. So it doesn't matter what you're going to come up in order to psychologically convince me to say something. It's just not true. Okay? And I don't care who you think the team leader is. This is my role. This is my responsibility. This is his role. We have nothing to hide. Now let us go. You have nothing against us. And let us continue with our project. Three hours turns to four hours, turns to five hours, turns to six hours. And eventually realize this is nighttime is coming most of the guards have already left we're gonna end up spending the night here now it was friday what happens friday night shabbat shabbat and one of the things that i've always kept my whole life besides just always keeping kosher i've always a kosher meat never mixed meat and dairy is i've never missed a kiddush in my life and not only did was i likely to miss kiddush right now but we also had a youth shabbat dinner prepared by all the nigerian Igbo youth that we're gonna come and welcome the Sifil Torah. And they came and they didn't even know where we were. Um, you know, thankfully word got out and they understood what the situation was and that it wasn't our will not to be there. And we find ourselves and we're realizing we're missing the Shushabbat. We missed the Shabbat preparations. We're gonna miss all these things. But in our minds, we're still positive. Everything happens for a reason. So now I'm thinking, okay, how am I gonna do Kiddush in this holding cell in this Nigerian governmental facility? And there's one of the guards there and we're talking to him. And I tell him, listen, we haven't eaten all day. Can you get us some fruits, some vegetables, you know, carrots and cucumbers and apples, pears, crackers, whatever you can find. And I have to ask you something that's very, very important. I need grapes. I don't care how, just find me some grapes. And he finds some grapes, comes back, and we take the grapes, we squeeze them, and we make kiddush over uh, the grapes. And uh, we're able to do kiddush. We did the motzi over some open crackers that they had left over somewhere. Um, and eventually with that, we go to sleep feeling good to ourselves. You know, tomorrow we'll get out. This is just a test. And we overcame the test. Unfortunately, it wasn't over. At this point, you guys are back together. At this point, wherever we're brought back into the holding room, we're all together. Only for interrogation do we get they brought separate. back and separated. The next morning we wake up, um, not to the sunlight, but to the same 15 armed gun militants that storm into the room at gunpoint, yelling at us, saying, get up, get up, get up. We quickly get up, put our shoes on. We're sleeping on the floor. Um, we start walking out and I see three white vans again. 
and we start heading to the vans. And I notice that they're bringing us all to the middle van this time, not to the each one to the our separate ones, but each one to the to the middle one. And immediately my mind starts working. I'm very pattern oriented recognition. If I see a shift, a change of patterns, immediately I'm gonna, I, I recognize it. That's just how my, my mind has always worked. So I'm like, okay, we came here this way. We're coming out of here differently. There's a change. Why? And they put Noam in, they put David in, they put Ima Lisbon in. And before I go in, I ask the guard, why are you taking us? And he says, you don't need to know. And he shoves me inside. And that's the moment that I realize this is not over and it could be only the beginning. People in Nigeria get executed left and right. We could be, you know, being brought to some jungle, some hole somewhere and executed. And so immediately in my mind, I have to think, how am I going to get out of this situation and save all the team members? Because there's no way that I'm going to end up in some random hole in Nigeria being killed where I'm part of the generation that just knows they're going to the death and doesn't do anything about it. And so I realized I have to do something. So I start calculating. Um, I'm looking at the uh, landscape, you know, are we going to rural area? Are we going to urban area? I'm looking at the signs. I'm looking at the kilometers. Are we getting closer to a certain city? Where are we going? I ask questions. I'm trying to pick up on the body language of the soldiers. You know, if you're about to execute someone, you're not going to be like falling asleep, you know, unless you're a crazy psychopath. So I'm trying to like judge the the emotions and the temperament of these people. Like, are they on edge? Are they calm? And eventually, after asking them many times, I found out that we're going to Abuja, which is one of the main cities in Nigeria, 15 hour drive from our original location. So we had, let's say, another 12 hour drive from where we were. Mm-hmm. And there they tell us you'll have your interrogation and we just have to ask you more questions. And that's the official place where we need to do it. I see Abuja coming closer and closer in the signs on the street. So I realize, OK, we're, we're going there. I don't have to do anything um, that's going to create an, a different situation that isn't going to happen. I would only do that if it's last situation possible. And finally, we get to, to Abuja. Uh, now this is a huge prison facility, like place that they have with offices, huge. We get there, um, they take us through the lobby inside, they put us into some uh, janitor room and we're waiting a few minutes. And then on the side of the janitor room, there's like a, um, a door like with the slits, you know, like on the locker room, you have mm-hmm. the slits you can see. And so they open this door, which we didn't even know it could be opened or what it was. And behind that door is a metal cage gate door. And they open that door and they pull out this like Nigerian man with like matted hair, has like a ripped shirt, ripped pants, swollen leg. You know, you see sometimes people with like huge legs that some sort of like infection that he has shackles on his feet, walking out like this, like weak from who knows how many months or years he's been in there. And they pull him out. They close. Was it a little room, a closet? We don't even know at this point. They close the gate, they close the door, and they walk him out. And I tell Noam and David, I'm like, listen, I think that they're planning to put us into whatever this cage is. Um, Under no circumstance are we going to go willingly. Because at this point, we haven't physically fought back. They pointed guns at us, they brought us, and they can technically say we walked willingly. You know, in this situation, we have been gone for 48 hours. We don't have a lawyer. We don't have a phone call. They took everything from us. This is illegal according to international rights and the UN rights. Uh, and human rights as well. Under no circumstance are we going to go in there willingly. If they want us in there, they'll throw us in there. They come back and they say, take off your shoes, take off your belts, take off uh, your watches. And at this point, we get what they're trying to do. This is what you do as someone that's going to be incarcerated. And we're like, there's no way that we're going in there. Like, we, the only way we go in there is if you give us a phone call. Because at least the world will know where we are. Because now we've disappeared from the face of the earth. I don't want you to make up anything. You give us a phone call, we'll comply. They don't want to hear anything, take us, throw us in there, lock the cage gate door, lock the wooden door. And we find ourselves in like a five meter by five. Your carpet is bigger than the room that we, that we went yeah. into. Um, you know, Nothing you, in the room? You have a rug, and this, this is bigger than the size of the room for three people. I would say it was half of this. And we're with a bunch of rat feces and human urine and bottles of human urine of that person that was there from before that they didn't let mm-hmm. him go to the bathroom and writings on the wall, my name is this, tomorrow they execute me, remember my name, this is the university of life, will Allah ever forgive me, you know, will my life ever see happiness, and there, the wall is thick of black, like shiny, of just human filth that is on the wall, there's mold that the ceiling is crumpling up, and you're, you're breathing in rat feces, I mean, within an hour, like, you're pulling out black from your nose from what you're breathing in, right, that, that's how your nose works, it's filtering, like, the mm-hmm. things, and, and we're in the most disgusting conditions that you could ever imagine. And we end up in this situation, and this it, is- It's just the three of you. Just the three of us. And the biggest threat to us at that time was David's health. 
David was 47, today he's 49. Um, Baruch Hashem, healthy and strong, an amazing person. Um, but unfortunately, he has an immune system disease that he requires medication in order for his immune system to function. After a week, if he doesn't have his medication, his immune system crashes and he dies. He's already had two cancers from his condition, so this is not something to play with. And we realize his medication is 10 hours away in uh, the hotel because they told us they would take us for two hours mm -hmm. and he's panicking because he knows where he's in the worst place that he could be for his condition if his immune system crashes. So now in my mind, I'm like, okay, how am I going to get David out of here? And we had many different strategies. I like man managed to pop open the wooden door and put my hand out and touch the table. And I told myself when the guards would leave, I'd grab a phone, send a message, this and that. And then I didn't have the codes because they all had Androids and a complicated code like that. So I told myself, okay, when they'd leave to the bathroom, if I get the phone, I need to know the codes. So I started studying them and seeing the codes that they would make on their phones and I would write their codes into the wall. So that was guard number four. If I take his phone, boom. I, I started thinking this is pure survival mode. Right. And after a few days of not giving us food, you know, they only gave us water. We were maybe like three, four days in without food. And I realized, okay, if they wanted to kill us, they would have killed us in the way. If they wanted to kill us, they just wouldn't be giving us water. Clearly they're giving us water, it's to keep us alive. So they're not giving us food not to kill us because we could survive a month without food. They're not giving us food for us to suffer so that we give up whatever information they think we're hiding, which means at some point they will bring us food. And how could we use this to our advantage? And so I start thinking and I'm like, okay, I have an idea. They come on the fourth or fifth day and they say, okay, here's your, here's your nasty Nigerian prison food. Um, they bring it to us and I'm saying, and I look at them, I look at the food and I look at them and I say, I'm sorry, I can't eat this. And they're kind of shocked. They're like, you guys must be starving. And they expected us to rush towards the food, you know, like some starved human beings that then are treated like animals. And I'm like, I'm sorry, the same way most of you are Muslim, you would understand that if someone gave you pork after a few days of not eating, if you were strong, you wouldn't eat it. I'm a Jew. I don't eat this haram thing. I eat halal, it's called kosher. I could only eat kosher. So I can't eat this food. I'm sorry. But I have a solution for you. There's something that I can eat there's a kosher place here in Abuja that if you tell them there are three Jews that need kosher food, they'll bring you food for free three times a day, for free. You don't have to do anything. They'll deliver you the food and that we can eat. And so they tried to call our bluff and didn't give us food for another day. And then they realized, okay, they're really not eating. They're really about this. So they called up this uh, Jewish kosher place and it happens to be the Chabad of Abuja. Oh, wow. And I knew that if Chabad were to hear that there are three Jews needing food in prison, that they would put two in together and realize that these are the three Jews, the three Israelis that are missing. And that would give our location up to the world of where we're being held. And the moment that that happened, the next day, the ambassador found out and everything else, everyone started realizing where we were. The ambassador rushes over to the Nigerian prison. Uh, Yotam, amazing guy who helped so much in the process, Israeli ambassador. Um, demands to see us. They're denying that we're there. And eventually he lets us, they let us see him at night. So then so, they ended up calling the restaurant and getting yeah. food. Well, oh. it wasn't even a restaurant. It was just Chabad. You know, oh. I, I just knew that if Chabad would hear, they would A, bring yeah, food, but B, would, would be able to put two and two together. Did Chabad know you were coming before? Yeah, we had spoken okay. to them, but we weren't supposed to be in Abuja. So right. like at no point were we like letting them know that we're going to visit them. I had just messaged them before uh, that we were around. Fascinating. And eventually the Israeli ambassador comes, Yotam, and I remember seeing him the first time and we were discussing the, the conditions that we're living in, no showers. So we're like rashes were growing on our bodies, like the conditions. And they bring us on the sixth day at night to, to this office. He's, he's there and I don't know what the Israeli ambassador looks like. He gets up and he says, I'm Yotam. I know your brother, Dylan. I know your mom, Joel. I'm an AEPI brother, the Jewish fraternity that I'm a part of. Don't worry, we'll get you out. And there's just like a relief. Finally, at least the world knows where we are, but I still have the pressure of this is day six, David tomorrow, his immune system crashes. And I tell you, I'm like, listen, I don't care what you have to negotiate, what you have to give up. You either get David out tonight and you bring him to the hospital or the next time come with a body bag. Simple as that. And this is the moment in your life where you look back 20 years from now and you say, I saved the life of the Jew or I didn't do enough to save the life of the Jew. So go and do enough. And he turns around and he negotiates and he was amazing. And finally they agree to let David out. Uh, he went to the hospital, got everything he needed. And eventually the French embassy actually extracted him the next day and took him to the embassy and he was safe from that moment on. So we were only me and Noam left. Huh. Uh, they negotiate to allow us to have uh, a meal a day from Chabad. They would bring us one meal a day. So we would have to eat it 
separately this one meal three times in order to balance out or two times depending on how hungry we were. And they would finally let us have a shower. So that night they took us to our first shower and they take us to uh, the bathrooms, which has this hole and a bunch of spider webs and spiders and, you know, disgusting. And they didn't have toilet paper. They had a bucket and you would fill up the water with a bucket and you would clean yourself with a bucket. And so I tell them, no, we, we need the shower, not, not the, the toilets. And they're like, that's your shower. Fill up the water, the bucket that they all use over there. You know, imagine how disgusting it is. And use that to, to dunk on your heads to take a shower. And so trust me, that was better than nothing. And that was our access to showers for the next two weeks. Um, and then uh, from there, they take us back to this cage. And there was the Christian guard that happens to be there that night. Now, this particular Christian guard, I had a special relationship with him because I was trying to psychologically gauge any individual that I was facing with and get them to like us or to see us as humans. Because, you know, when you have that guard prisoner relationship, a lot of times they see you as, as nothing. And he would always come with his, his Bible, his Christian Bible. And at one point I told him, you know, it says in your Bible that if you bless Israel, you'll be blessed. And if you curse Israel, you'll be cursed. Hmm. You're keeping me here. You're cursing me. At least give me a phone to text my mom. That would be a blessing and God will bless you so much. Uh, don't, don't talk to me. I was like, you know, you believe in Jesus. He was a Jew who lived in Jerusalem. I'm a Jew who lives in Jerusalem. This is my people. Don't talk to me. And at some point he breaks and he says, anyways, you guys are no longer the chosen people. You guys don't count because you guys don't accept Jesus. I'm like, ah, okay. Why don't we accept Jesus? You're saying that he's the Messiah. It says specifically in the Torah what the Messiah needs to do in order to be the Messiah. Those are things that... Jesus didn't do. We don't have world peace. We don't have unity. We don't have all these things. So how can you claim that Jesus is the Messiah? And he's like, you know what? Let me preach to you. Let me show you how in the Old Testament, it talks about Jesus. He starts opening the book. And I'm thinking to myself, damn, I don't know all the arguments against Christian missionaries of like what to say. But there's an amazing rabbi named Rav Tuvia Singer uh, who lives in Jerusalem, who makes debate videos against Christian missionaries all the time. And a week before I left to Nigeria, it just so happens to be the moment where I saw one of his videos and I memorized a specific argument against one of the lines that they use often. There's so many other things that they use. It could have been any, but in my mind, I'm like, there's no coincidences. It has to be this one. This is the only one I know how to respond to. <laughs> and before he even says it, I say, don't tell me you're pulling up Isaiah 53. And he looks at me in shock like, how do you know? I was like, because in Isaiah 53, it talks about the humble servant that you're saying it's Jesus. It doesn't say it's Jesus there. But if you read Isaiah 52, Isaiah 51, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 49, it talks about the humble servant. And it says that the humble servant is the nation of Israel. So in the previous chapters that you're intentionally taking out, that literally describes the character, and then it's talking about the character that's already been described. Now you're attributing a different person and you're saying now it's Jesus. And he's like, going through the pages and realizing everything I'm telling him is right. And he's A, shocked that I had the answer, but even more shocked that I knew what the question was before I even asked it. And from that moment on, he saw me as this great rabbi from Jerusalem. <laughs> and I'm not a rabbi, um, but we had that relationship where he had so many questions. And there are often questions he would come and ask me that I didn't have the answers for, right? And he would be like, what do you think about this? And what about that? And what about this passage? And I had to play it off. You know, I had to say, listen, you're not yet ready for, for those questions. Maybe in a few other classes, I'll tell you <laughs> to like keep this like relationship going of like he sees and he values us. And it ended up being to our benefit because when we got out from that first shower after David was finally released, he tells us, you know, I'm not allowed to tell you, but tomorrow they're bringing you to another cage. They're transferring you and there's two Boko Haram terrorists that will be with you. Um, and these people, one of them killed 70 people in a terror attack and they know you're Israeli and they know you're Jewish. So just be prepared. And because of that information, it gave me and Noam uh, the time to psychologically prepare of how we were going to deal with that situation, to take something that we turned into a weapon, to many things to prepare. So like, there are a bunch of small miracles that are happening along the way that are showing us you will survive. These are obstacles you just have to overcome. Even the interrogation room, when they would take us to interrogation, there's a long, long hallway. And there's one room, one room, one room, one room. And each room is the interrogation. Another room is the guards in charge of that case. So imagine a long hallway with that. And each room are numbered, and they would always take us at the end of the hallway to room number 18. What is 18? Chai. Mm. Chai. Life for the Jewish people. One of the most powerful and important Jewish uh, numbers in Gematria. In fact, Jews often give donations in multiples of 18. Um, so maybe you'll give 180,000. <laughs> <laughs> and so the room right across from that room, which was the guards in charge of our case, is what room? What number do you think? Close to 18, but powerful number. 17. No. Tov. Not that close. Not that close. 
It's a 26. Exactly. Oh, really? You'd cave up. Yeah. Yeah. If I had, if someone were to ask me the two most powerful n- numbers of the Jewish right. people, I would have said 18 and 26. For sure, yeah. And it's like no coincidence that the two rooms that are associated to our case that they're always taking us that are across from each other is 18 and 26. When you would think, you know, usually the even numbers are here. Odd. No, 18 and 26. And I'm thinking, okay, there has to be something more here. Like what is being communicating? Like what what is going on? And on one of the days that we're going to the interrogation, I'm, I'm walking over and every doorknob on the way to our door has something that is, looks like Hebrew. I'm like, I must be losing my mind in here. And I look closer and the guard's like, what are you doing? I'm like, no, I just, I just want to see what's written on the doorknob. And I look closer and it's Hebrew. It says Magen. It's an Israeli door company that sold the doors to this <laughs> Nigerian prison interrogation wing, uh, which is funny on itself. But what does that tell me? 26 Magen 18. Magen means to defend or to protect. 26 means God, 18 means life. God is protecting your life. And there are so many signs like this that kept reoccurring and reoccurring and reoccurring that allowed us to know that we were protected, that we will get out of here. We didn't know when it would be, but eventually after three weeks, my parents and other individuals put enough pressure and united a lot of people to eventually have the governments of the countries we were associated to have French, American, and Israeli citizenship. And collectively, we also have Noam has American and Israeli and David has French and Israeli. So we also collectively have all those. And we eventually had enough pressure put on the Nigerian government to let us go. We uh, were taken outside. I remember the first time seeing sun, uh, you know, feeling it on my my face. I can feel my my cheeks vibrating. I I remember seeing color and it being so vibrant, the grass and green and, and red and someone walking their dogs and cars. I mean, we were taken away from, right. from all of our Everything. senses for, for three weeks. It's just a rush of, of stimulation that all of a sudden comes back to you. And, you know, they take us to this interrogation uh, facility after for uh, immigrants that are being deported and they take us pictures with the, you know, like the, the ones when you're being arrested with the sign and the, the fingerprints and everything. And then they take us to the Chabad. We have like our first normal meal. We take our first normal shower. I remember the, the shower was like black on the floor. You know, like oh. just black, just and and not like a second, like nonstop. Like I'm an hour in the shower, and it's just black is coming off. And eventually, they take us to the airport. All the guards are surrounding us. They take us through security, through the terminal, through the hall until you get to the plane. And only when we got on the plane, they gave us our passports and phones. We took a flight from Abuja to Istanbul, Istanbul to Israel, and you know, within a few hours from being in prison, we find ourselves back in Israel. Unbelievable. And the moment we got back, it was difficult to to go to sleep. I couldn't sleep for about a week, two weeks from just the overstimulation. It wasn't trauma. It wasn't, I'm afraid. I wasn't, I wasn't like, a, you know, like I'm, I'm strong and I stood strong the whole time and I'm going to continue to be strong. It was just like, my mind can't go to sleep. There's just so much going on around me. And I started seeing like the color red and be like, wow, what a beautiful color. It's my favorite color. And I haven't seen this color in so long. And it's such a beautiful color. And you start appreciating such small things that you take for granted, like colors, you know? And What uh, would be the problem if it was trauma? It, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, but I do think that trauma has a lot to do with how you process the moment in the moment. Um, and I think for me, when I look back at that moment, or even in the army, right? There are moments where we served in the army with my friends, And most people came out okay, and some people completely messed up. And when I tried to understand why they came out messed up, I looked a lot at what they were doing in the very moment. And in the moment, they were in shock. They didn't know what to do. And so I think memory has a lot to do with playing back what you went through and in that moment how you felt. And that has a lot to do, not only, but a lot to do with how your your trauma plays out. So in my opinion, I don't have trauma from this experience. Um, I can't speak for, for Noam and David. Um, they can speak for themselves, but that was mostly um, that was mostly from overstimulation of just there, there's just so much rushing in my mind. You know, you have your phone, you have messages, this person conversation, that that you go from nothing to everything. Right. There's a connection um, that you seem to have made. The fact that I'm strong, I don't have to have trauma, which could suggest that someone who does. Has- uh, that's not what I meant. If that's what you took. Right. Um, I just meant that you can be strong and have trauma. You can be weak and not have trauma. Um, I just think that trauma has a lot to do with if the moment that was traumatic, you took it as something that hurt you or you took it as something that built you. And when I was in that moment, I saw that this was a test. 
I did not at one point think right. I was a victim. I did not at one point think, even though I'm locked there in a cage. There was no point over the few weeks that you gave up hope that I, you... I am I was the, the author to my story there. I'm not the one that's a victim, even though you're keeping me in a cage. I mean, the, and it was a constant battle. I mean, there's a point they take us in an elevator. We're on the fifth floor. For the first time, they take us up an elevator. And there's the two guards and me and Norm. And I see floor five, four, three, two, one, minus one. Now I'm like, wow, I didn't even know there's a basement. If I plan to escape, at least now I know the the, archeo- the architecture of, of this place. And I asked them, you know, what's in floor minus one? And they they look at me with the like broken uh, English and they say, need to know. And I get it. He's like, you don't need to know. And the other guy's laughing. Ha ah, I got you. Finally, he <laughs> got you. You always seem to be the, the smart one here. He, he got you. And I'm like, uh, you didn't really get me. He's like, you get what he means by need to know? I was like, yeah, I get it. I don't need to know. Ha, so funny. You know, I was like, it's a shame because I was going to tell you what's on minus two. He's like, what do you mean? What's on minus two? I was like, need to know. So constantly <laughs> we had this like, in my mind, I was, I'm here being tested. I am fully aware that I'm being tested and I will overcome everything around me. So in that moment, I didn't feel traumatized. I didn't feel attacked. Um, so because I had that perspective, I think that's what prevented me from having trauma, in my opinion. Maybe you're so traumatized you don't even want to admit you're traumatized. Maybe, maybe. Um, how would we measure it? Ayahuasca. <laughs> maybe. Well, we can talk about that too. <laughs> Let's go there. Because I'm not, listen, I'm far from an expert on trauma, although it's something that I... Um, I'm very interested in, interested in my own story. So I'd be curious because I would think that there are certain things that are um, inherently traumatizing. I don't have a negative association with trauma. It just, it is, you know, in much the same way that you accumulated black on the outside of your body, you could have accumulated black on the inside of your body and it has to be um, washed out in a different uh, way. I understand from uh, some of our conversations offline that you have experienced with ayahuasca. That was before this or after this? Much before this. Before this. Okay, so that would be the good, the good measure, right? If you did ayahuasca after this, true, and nothing needed to be cleaned out from the um, uh, the inside, then I would say somehow you uh, you avoided trauma in the scenario. Today, I stand here somewhat skeptical that a situation like that couldn't have created, um, couldn't have created um, trauma. But you know, I respect. Uh, let, let me ask you a question. Story. Let's say, for example, a very relevant and in recent instance instance in israel is you have rockets right for me it doesn't traumatize me like i'm used to it i've lived in israel i've been every single summer in israel usually wars are in the summer i served in the army to me it's like okay we're at war and we're continuing to another person that has never been to israel they could go through that and like you know experience serious trauma so is it that you must have trauma from all experiences that are hard or could it be that it really depends on your perspective on the situation happening? It could be, but I think that at some point during very difficult experiences, someone is going to, there is going to be a negative memory, a negative, a negative um, experience, belief that could be re-triggered. Um, let me say, let's, let's say with child sex abuse, because I've spoken about that a lot. So it took me a while to a, talk to anyone about it, to acknowledge it, and to also acknowledge the way it affected me. Um, and I, many people have told me that, you know, when I was uh, at the beginning of my speaking, I started speaking. That was the very first subjects I spoke about were child sex abuse. When I say speaking, I mean speaking publicly. And oftentimes I'd invite people to events that I was speaking at. And sometimes, you know, you can see that someone had been through a lot and I figured that maybe it was abuse. I'd call them up and say, I have one person in mind now. We're calling him up. He was a rabbi. And I said, hey, you know, it'd be great if you came to this event. And why should I come? I said, because this is, a, this is something that's affected a lot of people in our community, and it could be good if you were there as well. And after going back and forth, he said, I was sexually abused. It didn't affect me. So how do you know it didn't affect you? How do you know? Um, and the real measure for that, when I say, if you want to know how trauma, if you want to know how sexual abuse affected you, ask someone's wife. And I say the same thing about ayahuasca. If you want to know how ayahuasca affected someone, ask their spouse. Um, so I'm not, I'm not here to debate. I'm only here as someone who's this is not a debating podcast at all For sure. it's i'm only here as someone who is sensitive to trauma and sensitive to people's experiences with it that understands that people could have heard what you said for you it's fine it's good if you're feeling in a good place today i have nothing to say i'm saying for someone else for them hearing it and for if, if they're at the beginning of recognizing their own trauma and for to hear something that may sound like an association of with strength doesn't come then. I know you didn't mean that, but if it can be heard like that, I just felt yeah. that I have a responsibility Good. to speak about it. 
Do you want to talk about the um, ayahuasca experience? I'd love to hear about Sure, uh, it's another uh, long story, but uh, definitely one of the stories that changed my life. So, first of all, for those who don't know what ayahuasca is, it's a uh, plant medicine. But what's this? What, what time are we? Just so I have a. One, uh, okay, so just start again from for those who. Okay. What, so it's about almost 12. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so we'll go like another between 10 and 20 minutes. Okay. okay. For those who don't know. For those who don't know what ayahuasca is, it's a plant medicine found primarily in the Amazon in South America, which takes two plants, the roots of a specific tree and a vine that grows around that tree, and they take them together, they grind them up, they boil it up, and you drink it. It's a natural uh, plant, and it creates something within uh, your brain uh, for which you have your pineal gland that secretes dimethyltryptamine, DMT. Um, and that gland has a um, ability to produce, but also has uh, something, a function that reduces so that the production is not so much. And specifically, the combination of these two plants together, ground it up and heat it up, then prohibits the prohibitors. So you have basically free access to infinite amount of dimethyltryptamine and increases the production of dimethyltryptamine. So when you're taking ayahuasca, you're going into your subconscious while conscious times infinite. And it's really- Brian, this is something that's triggered just, um, this is something that's triggered in early life, they say, and near death yes. experiences that exactly. massive amounts of DMT is um, so yeah. so The actual also when vine, you the actual vine, the ayahuasca vine actually works in the stomach mm -hmm. that it prevents, it's an MAO inhibitor. So it prevents the breakdown of the DMT. And then the leaf, which usually they use shakuna leaf, that, that's, the highest concentration of DMT in a plant. So it's the ayahuasca vine, which shuts off the enzyme from breaking it down, and then the DMT from the chacruna. And it's possible that it also increases additional DMT from the brain. I'm not sure. But those two are what allow for the, some people say, a, a born-again experience, a near-death experience, which is exactly what happens yeah. on, um, which exactly when it's secreted naturally and what ayahuasca often um, creates. And, a rebirth or a near-death yeah. experience. So go ahead. And that's why it's important to break it down because anyone who's listening has to truly understand what we're talking about because this is not something just to take lightly. Um, and it's all the research that I did prior to deciding that I wanted to to try this. How long um, did you research it before? Uh, so I found out about it going backwards. I was raised very homeopathic, meaning never took medication, never taken a pill in my life. I've never taken Advil, Tylenol, pain medication, you know, antibiotics, never touched it. Um, I was raised only with plants. Um, you know, you take some ginger and some lemon and some honey and some tea when you have a mm -hmm. sore throat, you drink water and sleep when, when you have a headache, you know, these are natural remedies that exist out there that you don't need to take all these chemicals. Now, some people have conditions where they do need to sure. take it, they're understandable, but Boch Hashem, I've always been healthy and I've always been able to, to overcome with, with natural plants that are in this earth that were created to heal our bodies. Um, and I learned about ayahuasca in 11th grade, 2010, I was living in Palo Alto at the time before that in Miami and after that in Miami. And when I found out about it, I saw a documentary on YouTube. I think it was called The Spirit Mo Molecule. Uh, Joe Rogan was in it and you had yeah. all these different individuals. And what fascinated me the most is you had like Harvard scientists talking about this plant being something that heals people, that cures people, that allows people to overcome their traumas, that allows drug addicts to no longer be drug addicts because they're facing the darkness that is making them take the drugs in the first place. And you know, I was like, okay, this is clearly something that is beneficial if used properly. And if, I basically told the universe, I told Hashem, one day I have a feeling that the place to do it is in, is in Peru. I had a, a feeling that this is where one day I'll get to Peru and one day I would want to do it there. And if I'm there, I'd have to see four miracles happening for me to, to submit and to do it. <laughs> Number one, I have to find the right group of people or person to be able to do it with. Number two, I have to write find the right substance, something organic, not chemically altered, not made by anyone sketchy. Number oh, so it wasn't talking about ayahuasca necessarily, it was talking about maybe DMT. Ayahuasca. Ayahuasca, okay. Ayahuasca. I didn't want to try the synthetic Okay, version. so the right shaman group. The right shaman, the right group, uh, the right substance. And by the way, the shaman meant no idol worship, no avodazara, no black okay. magic, none of that, like pure nothing with that. And the right location. If those four things are revealed to me, for me, I submit. Years later, I mean, 2011, I graduated high school. I served in the army in Israel. I lived a year in LA, a year in Asia. I went three years in New York, graduated from Columbia, and then I went to South America in 2019 to do a research project on the Jewish communities there. 
And I find that's myself, part of this documentary or something else. Uh, part of the greater mission, not part of the documentary. Understood. Um, and so I get to Cusco again Friday morning. I land at 9 a.m. and the Airbnb check-in is 3 p.m. And I rush over to uh, the Chabad because I wanted to put my luggage down. And there I met this guy who looks over to me and says, hey, aren't you Rudy from the videos? Isn't that? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh, my name is Eden. Shout out to Eden. And, you know, right, right away, sometimes you connect with people and they're like, For good sure. energy. Your, your brothers or homies right away, maybe from past lives, you already know each other. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I actually saw you in Rio at the Chabad there for Shabbat, but you were leaving and I didn't say hi and now I get to see you again. It's so amazing. I love what you do. And right away we click. And he had also just arrived. And I'm like, all right, let's let's do this together. You know, when you travel solo, you end up meeting people along the way. Mm -hmm. And we walk around in Cusco and I tell the rabbi, I'll come back. Um later uh for shabbat so let me just check into the airbnb i go to the airbnb it was like you know some off road on the side and you get into this like thing and there's like a, a, a little like center and then there's like these buildings and there's a staircase and there's a key to open enter the staircase and there's a key to open to like after end of the staircase and you go in and there's like this little complex and there's a, a room and there's a bathroom and there are two separate doors and I have like a bundle of keys for every single door <laughs> that I'm opening. And finally I'll get in, I put my stuff down. It's actually super nice. And, and you know, the way they made it aesthetically and I go out with my towel and I go outside, I go open the door for, for the shower that I had already opened earlier. I only took the key for, for the shower and I get in, I shower and I come out and thought I had left the door open for, for the door, for the room, and the door is locked, and the key for the, for the door is locked. <laughs> I don't even have my, my clothes on, my phone's inside. I'm like, gated, 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 <laughs> key, 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 nobody there. And I'm looking, oh my God, what am I gonna do? <laughs> now, there's a small little yeah. like window that I can scream from, and maybe someone that passes down the street that enters into there, they can hear me. And I start yelling for like 20 minutes, and finally someone comes, and they come to this like little like platform area, and they, they see me, they're like, ¿Qué pasa? And I'm like, eh, mira, necesito mi pantalones, eh, necesito mi, mi, mi vetmo. Like I'm using French words to like insert in because it's so similar. Eh, pero necesito entre la puerta. No, no, no trabajo et tacleo. How do I say key in Spanish now? No trabajo. And I'm trying to explain and he's not understanding anything I'm saying. I was like, I need a locksmith. Necesito de cle, de porta, de porta. Like I'm saying everything I can and uh, nothing. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna have to bust through, open this door. So I like <laughs> run and bust open through it. Uh, there's actually the corner of the kitchen it was inside and I like cut myself here, but all was good. I got in, eventually I paid the Airbnb like $50 to fix the lock. So <laughs> it was fine. And there was many other locked ways to get in. So nobody could have broken in. Because of that, I ended up being late for the Shabbat. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually, a lot of people don't know this because they see me speaking and I'm good at expressing myself. I've had to develop that, but I'm very introverted. You know, when people see me in public, I'm usually quiet. Like I'm, I'm listening, I'm studying, and I'll only say something if I have something to say. And so in my mind, I'm like, okay, perfect. Shabbat, no one's going to recognize me, only eat in, but we're homies. And I'm going to like enjoy and be on the side and not be the center of attention. And uh, because I came late, Eden spoke to the Chabad rabbi, who happens to be a, in the paratroopers, by the way. So when do you get to meet the Chabad rabbi who served <laughs> in the paratroopers? That was crazy. And I find myself in, uh, in the Shabbat dinner, and he tells the rabbi, and the rabbi is like, Rudy, you have to come and give a lachaim and give a speech to everyone who wants you to. I'm like, oh, no. I'm like, okay, fine. And then uh, after we do the Kiddush and the Motzi, he's like, yalla, Rudy's going to give a lachaim. And I speak from the bottom of my heart. And I share something, I don't even remember what I talked about, but always when I speak, I speak from my heart. And everyone was moved. There were like 50 people, families and Israelis after the army and young couples and older couples. And, uh, and the rabbi was like this, very focused. And he says, you know, I wanna do something that I haven't done in a long time. I wanna do a Kabbalah learning retreat in front of Machu Picchu. And I'm like, wow, this sounds like the coolest mm -hmm. thing I've ever heard, learning Jewish mysticism, which a bunch of Israelis in front of Machu Picchu and the nature, you know, of course. And so he decides to do this on Sunday and a bunch of us Israelis were like 20 that agreed to go. We go out uh, three hours to get to Machu Picchu. And on the way, uh, my friend uh, comes to me and he says, hey, Rudy, have you ever heard of ayahuasca? <laughs> and I'm like, I have. Have you? <laughs> and he says, uh, yeah, I have. Are you are you interested? 
And I'm like, yeah, I'm interested. I've heard a lot about it. I've done my research. This is what I would need to see. Technically, I have the first one because you're the right people to do it with. And he tells me I was supposed to do it in Mexico and in Brazil. It didn't work out. And so I want to potentially uh, do it here in, in Peru. And so I tell him, look, I would need, I have the right person to do it with. I don't care a group of people or individual, but I need the right shaman, the right substance, the right location. And so he tells me, he's like, uh, maybe there's like a, a rabbi here who's on the program uh, as well, who, who's been here for, for a long time. Um, and he's like associated to the Jewish community and he's in and out and he's in Israel sometimes and he's over there and maybe we, we can talk to him and ask him about, uh, about ayahuasca. And so we go to him and we ask him and we say, listen, uh, uh, what do you know about uh, ayahuasca? And he tells us, look, what is your reasoning for doing it? What are your intentions? Are you trying to fix yourself or are you trying to better yourself? I'm like, wow, that's a very interesting question. I think we all definitely have something to fix, whether we realize it or not. Um, but for me, I want to be a better version of myself. I want to be, uh, you know, be more aware, more conscious, more understanding, more open-minded. Um, and for Eden, he, he wanted to see Hashem. He had a hard time with Imuna. You know, for me, I've never doubted at one point that there's a creator, that we're all part of this infinite oneness. Um, and for him, he had a hard time and he wanted to, to grasp that and he wanted the proof. You know, he wanted, you, I want to see, I want to, I want to believe. Um, we tell him and he tells us, I actually recommend you to do it. I know another uh, Jewish guy that uh, makes it. Um, and I know a shaman woman that's been doing it with a bunch of Jews and Israelis. He was okay with both of those as reasons? Yes. Fix or better? Yes, because it, it was for the positive. But not curiosity. Not, not curiosity or for fun or for this or that or the experience. It was genuine growth. Uh, and even the answer that I gave is like, I want to be a better version of myself. I want to be a better human. Like I want to grow. I want to, I want to, I want to obtain and be able to do better in this world. Um, and both of those reasons were, were reasons of growth. And he said, those are two good reasons. I know someone I can connect you that makes it. I know someone else that knows a woman that does it in a kosher way. So now we have the substance. We have the person to do it with. We have the uh, shaman. All I'm missing is the location. Now, the place that we were doing this retreat in just so happens to be owned by uh, Bnei Nusim Jews, which means Sephardic Jews that eventually were forced to convert to Catholicism and had lost their identity, but a lot of them are coming back and are not yet recognized as Jews, which is season three for We Were Never Lost. And their daughter just so happened to have gone to Israel five years before us being there on a birthright trip and stayed in Israel and just made Aliyah. And... Um, that moment that we were there, it just so happens again, it's like everything's a coincidence, mm -hmm. but it's not a coincidence. It just so happens to be the moment that she's visiting her family after five years. And she comes back from Israel super Israelified with the blunt stones mm -hmm. and the nose rings and the kapara lecha chaim sheli, makore naim sheli, like speaking all the Israeli <laughs> slang with a Latina accent. And we become really close with her. And eventually we ask her, you know, could we use the place of your parents? Can you ask them for us? They agree. And so boom, all those four things are revealed. And that moment I submit. And so we pick up the stuff. We have to go through a, a diet for a week before. Um, no meats, no animal products of any kind, no salty foods, additional salts or additional sugars, no fried food. Uh, even if you're married, no sex um, because you're taking on the energy of another person. No drugs, no medication. Like you really want to, to cleanse yourself to be really the fullest with yourself and not when you eat meat, you're absorbing the, the energy of the animal. When, you know, to, to be really with your own energy. And so we do a diet for, for a week. Um, we, the diet was just physical or also um, in terms of what you're reading, social media, stuff like also, that, that. Also, also that's everything. true. Um, also, you want to separate yourself from negativity. You want to be in a good, healthy space. You want to be, you know, breathing, breathing right. You want to do a lot of these things to get yourself prepared for this uh, very powerful and life-changing moments that yeah. you're going to go through. One way I've communicated this to myself prior to ayahuasca experiences is if I'm bringing someone for a deep cleaning. I'm not going to leave like a paper towel on the floor. Yeah. Then they come in, they come with their power tools and they're busy cleaning up things that I could have cleaned up before. Yeah. So we get all that out of the way. So all their time could be spent just on the deep exactly. cleaning. So, go so ahead. We, we get uh, the ayahuasca. It was given to us in a, in a bottle and we have to pick up these buckets that uh, you end up throwing up in. And we fly out the shaman woman. She was maybe $70 flight away you know, like an hour away and we fly her out and we go to this location that we were there a week before because in that time we had gone back and traveled a bit and we get ready. It's nighttime. We're in our 
uh, Peruvian ponchos and have the sudra wrapped around my heads. And she asked us to sing like songs, Jewish songs. And we're doing these like Chabad Nigunim and we're like singing like Shalom Aleichem and Yerushalayim Shel Zahav and the Tikva and all the like Israel Jewish songs that we can think of is just like pouring out to set the ambiance. And then she says, okay, sit down. She pours maybe like a shot worth um, and she has us drink it. And the taste that I remember was uh, a mix of blueberry and coffee that was fermented. That was very earthy. Um, and so... Did you like the taste? I wouldn't say I liked it. I wouldn't say I disliked it. Um, I would say it was interesting. It wasn't something that I would drink from wanting to uh, enjoy a taste. But you didn't um, find it repulsive. I found it repulsive the second time. Because my mind had already associated throw up to this taste. Uh, which Understood. is interesting how it happens. So I, I drink it. You're a little traumatized. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like I'm messing you, you have this like a uh, moment of drinking vodka and then you're like, oh, don't, don't I, have, I have that with any like move, move coconut, tequila away from me. Any coconut or coffee, like liquors or I got drunk on both of those as a yeah, teenager. Yeah, exactly. One with coconut, I forget which one, and exactly. one with a coffee one. And I'm <laughs> never. Exactly. Never, so I remember the first time trying it, no issue. Mm. Uh, I drink it. Uh, I lay down. And I'm just like this, waiting, 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 and the whole night waited and nothing. I didn't feel anything, I didn't feel drunk, I had nothing at all. And uh, my friend, he sees uh, the universe and back. <laughs> <laughs> At six in the morning, we hadn't gone to sleep yet, and she's like, okay, it's finally time to go to sleep. And I'm like, what, that's it, I didn't see anything. And he comes to me like, bro, did you see that? I'm like, what? What did you see? <laughs> and he's like, oh, I have to tell you when I wake up. And we go to sleep, wake up a few hours later. And he's like, bro, I saw the matrix. I saw the Hebrew letters and the colors and the energies. And I looked at you and there was like radiating, radiating light out of you. And your soul came out. And he was looking at what I was looking. And it made me so comfortable that I just let go. And God took me through this journey of teaching me the answers of life through a series of five books. And every time that one was given to me, it was taken away to show me it exists. But it's not meant for mm -hmm. you to know. And he's like describing me this out of this world experience and i'm like wow that's i'm so happy for you like amazing that you are to experience that and then at the same time i'm questioning like why wasn't i able to see you know mm. all these miracles just happened in one day all the answers that i asked years ago revealed themselves and, and nothing now i've always had a very strong tolerance for alcohol or anything so i was like okay maybe i didn't take enough so i'm like okay i have, I have one more day before i go to bolivia one more day i'm gonna try it one more time and uh, I do it the next night. I take like five times the amount. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this for sure has to work mm -hmm. tonight. And I find myself in, and you're not, you're not high. Like, I don't want people to think that you're taking this and you're like, ah, like not at all. You're very much so there. You're just more there. Like you see right. more than what you normally see. Um, it's like you have one eye that's missing or two eyes that's missing. And all of a sudden you see one and you see that you're like able to see further than the reality that you see. And so I take it, everything is dark. And I start seeing, you know, the old uh, PC screensavers of, of space. That's like you're moving through space mm -hmm. in the old PC screensaver. So I feel like it's that. And I'm, in, I'm, I'm seeing a bunch of white dots and I feel like I'm in space. But I feel deep down inside of me, there's a trajectory in the direction that I'm going. Like it's not random. And I'm going like stopping at specific stars and going one after the other. And I get to the to the first star and I get closer and it's it's not a star, it's a it's a rectangle. It's clearly shaped as a rectangle. And I get closer and it's a, and I realize it's a screen. There's a movie playing. There's like it's like action animated, like movie playing. And I get closer and before I enter into the screen, I realize it's one of my memories. And that's the moment I realize these are all my memories that are in this. Space. All the little dots. All the little dots are just scenes of my memories. And I go into the first one. And I don't remember. Was it a specific memory or you don't remember? When I was born, when I was like eight years old, two days old, three years old, like 12 years old, just like, like I don't know. Random good memories, bad memories. Both. Just like, yeah. And I find myself like, whoom, all, and I see, and I, I'm watching the memory. I'm watching things play out. And there are things that I didn't remember for, for, for 20 something years. And I'm seeing it. I'm like, I remember this. It's so clear. I remember how going through this. And I'm not only remembering what I'm seeing, I'm remembering what I was feeling. I'm remembering what I was thinking in the moment. I remember everything all at once. And at the same time, I have my own individuality where I could look at the scene playing and also have my own perception with the information I have today, with the maturity I have today, and interpreting it differently than I interpreted then. And contrasting the differences and realizing I was so mad at my mom for screaming at me, but now looking back, 
I realized that she was screaming at me. I was doing something wrong. I didn't realize it in the moment. And it was just whoom, in and out of different memories of seeing the full. It was, it, was a, it was a journey of healing my memories. A journey of being able to understand at least a more holistic version of what truly was happening there. And only years later did I realize how much it helped me to understand the world. And realizing that the information we have, even the information I had then of comparing the two, is finite. And there's so much more truth that's inclusive. And how truth really works is the combination of all truths together. And I didn't realize it in the moment, but after I finished my South America trip, I moved to Israel and I started getting very involved with bringing Israelis and Palestinians together. And before that trip, I was a student at Columbia University. I founded the Israel Group on campus. I had brought Israelis and Palestinians together for events. But my general look towards the Palestinian issue was, unfortunately, you're being brainwashed. You're against me. I don't want to be against you. I will do everything not to be against you. But until you come to me and to the table to come together, I have nothing else to do for you. Like, that was my mentality. Right. Like, I'm not against you. And I will be there to fight for, but I'm not going to go out of my way to, to like, correct you. Because it's up to you to come to the table. I came halfway. You come halfway. After that experience, only years later, did I realize that it made me understand how much of a responsibility I have not to go halfway, to go all the way for anyone and everything that sees a lack of truth, that hates or has, you know, negative feelings, I have to go out of my way to correct. I have to go. It's not about halfway, halfway. It's not about equal. You see further, you have a further responsibility to go out of your way. And that, Can you bridge the gap for me and the listeners? How did that experience translate to that? Do you know? So because of that, I started getting involved with uh, a lot of different movements on the ground that unites Israelis and Palestinians. But no, I'm um, saying, how did the ayahuasca experience translate to you understanding that for sure. you have to go 100%? So my and each experience is very different i only had one real experience right. although i did it twice 100%. so i can't say compared to others i've only had one that experience allowed me to see how holistic truth works allowed me to see that in my memories what i know to be true everything that i've experienced was something completely different than what i had originally thought when you have a different perspective included into it so you felt having had this gift from ayahuasca or from the ayahuasca experience that you saw the way truth works, that there's infinite levels to it, that now when someone else is stuck and they're not seeing the truth, okay, I have a gift, I'm going to go out of my way to share it. Yeah, is that and the understanding that, you know, and it's not just Palestinians, some Israelis were raised to hate Palestinians, some Palestinians were raised to hate, to hate Israelis. And so it's not about just saying, the moment that you're ready, we're going to talk. It's about going out there and saying, I understand that you were taught or come to the conclusion or contextualize your reality by thinking that I'm the source of your problem. I know I'm not the source of your problem. I'm not just going to wait for you to see that. I'm going to be it so that you see that it's not that. And it's very similar to the experience I had, you know, that activated me when I was younger. When I was seven years old, I got kicked off of a bus with my mom and young, your brother. Yeah. And I started asking myself, why did this neo-Nazi kick me and my mom and my brother off the bus? He doesn't know us. Why does he hate us so much? And all those things I started to realize that person doesn't know me. So it's not a personal attack. It's because that contextualization of that person's fears or traumas or pain were taught to him that the reason you suffer is because of Jews. Now he's projecting his emotions and his conclusions onto me. And when I understand the bigger picture, the holistic picture of why he's even started that in the first place, then instead of dealing with the symptom, I can deal with the source. I can go as to where the source of this problem is. And that really, I mean, I, I guess it developed over time, over, over the years, but Ayahuasca really gave me the ability to, to understand that on a much deeper level. Do you feel, going back to earlier in our conversation, we were speaking about the we are never close and you seem to have some um, frustration. We were never people. lost. Do we were never, what did I say? We are never close. We will be close. Yes, sir. <laughs> Freudian slip. <laughs> I need to do more ayahuasca. In regards to the conversation earlier about we were never lost. Um, there seemed to be some frustration towards people who don't see it the way you do in this regard. Do you feel like there's some room? And at the time, I, I brought that up for you and said maybe there's a different way of looking at it. Do you feel like there's some room to interject uh, the lessons from the ayahuasca experience into that? For sure. Um, you know, the frustration is not from people not knowing because it's not their fault. The frustration I have is from people then hearing about it and rejecting it. And that hurts, you know, because it's like, you have a brother and a sister that you've never heard of and you should have that reaction that I had of like, let me meet them and let me make up for lost times and let me help them. And you kind and, of want. And, and I see my other brothers like not seeing my other, and, and it hurts, you know. Um, You're frustrated that they're not meeting you halfway. It's frustrating, but you know, to be You're able, going around the world to Africa. To be able to see the whole truth 
you have to include other lenses, other views, other perspectives. And that's the whole reason of this documentary. It's really a lens for the world to see. And by the way, in the documentary, we bring geneticists, the head geneticists of Columbia University. We bring rabbis, we bring archeologists, we bring historians. Like We're not just looking at this from one perspective, we're really bringing the whole perspective for that anyone seeing it can really understand on their own language and terms to be able to understand what we're trying to do here. Understood. Just one question I'll end with this. The, the experience in Nigeria. Yeah. You had mentioned numerous miracles you saw along the way. The 26, Magain, 18, the, you know, the specific uh, Tuvia Singer um, YouTube video you had seen just before and, and many other things. You said there was this knowing that you had to go through this. Have you figured that out what that is yet? Like, how did this experience change you? What did it teach you? What can we learn from it without sitting in a Nigerian prison for three weeks? For sure, great question. And I'm sure I might have other answers in addition to the answers I have now in the future. You know, sometimes- Truth is infinite. It takes many years for, for you <laughs> yeah. to then understand. Um, there's several reasons. And in the moment, we're trying to find a logical answer. Number one, we were interrogated by a lot of the people who are in the government and who are in charge of cases against the Igbos. And in those interrogations, we realized they really have no idea about who the Igbos are. And in the conversations, I was constantly like saying, you should know that they're actually really great people. They're human beings just like you. I was like planting these seeds in their minds for them the next time that maybe they're in a case or something, they'd have more like, you know, humanity in them and see the other person as a human. So maybe we impacted many people that could have done things that were wrong to others that now we shifted that a little bit and maybe ended up saving lives. Number one. Number two, the whole goal of going there um, was not to, you know, David told me, he's also a journalist, the one who was, you know, with the medical situation. When we got back, he says, you know, Rudy, the number one rule of journalism is when you go to tell a story, not to become the story. And we came to tell a story, now everyone's talking about us. <laughs> so, you know, although they were talking about us, which was not our goal, a lot of people were like, well, what were they doing there in the first place? Oh, the Igbos, what are the Igbos? And so it opened that conversation up that now a lot of Jews have heard about the Igbos. They don't yet really know what's going on because we haven't released a documentary or they haven't looked it into it themselves, but they know that it's happening. There's clearly a shift within our generation that's now talking about these issues. And you can say that this played a role. There's other things. Other countries in Africa that we went to afterwards had heard of our arrest and it's immediate, you know, we're good. We know you're real. You went to prison for us and you're still coming back to Africa. You guys are real. There's no need sometimes to like, you know, this is what we're doing. They know right away. So there's a lot of things that, that have happened that because that happened, it opened up doors. Did it change you personally in some way? It's hard to answer that because I do think it did, but I don't have the words to be able to explain that. Um, I, I don't think it, it changed me from I went here and now I'm there. It's an evolution. And every experience that I've had in my life has constantly been an evolution to grow, to test me, to make me develop even more. Did it make me develop more? Yes. Like I, I felt, you know, I, I can overcome any, I overcame in Nigerian prison with Boko Haram terrorists being starved for a week, not knowing when I'd get out. I overcame that. Now, any situation that I'm in, you know, people are like, oh, this, the chair is not comfortable enough, doesn't go backwards enough. My bed is too hard. The AC is not too strong enough. And I look at that, I'm like, we're so privileged to be complaining of these things. So it gives you an ability to look at life in such a more happier way to understand, you know, the blessings that you're given and the responsibility to use the potential to fulfill your mission in this earth. So I'll share what impacted me from, uh, from that story and I'll connect it to my first ayahuasca experience. So in my first ayahuasca experience, um, it showed me that there was a time where I was a very good listener and I had lost that skill. And the reason I lost the skill the gift was because the gift became a source of pain because I was witnessing pain around me and maybe naturally being born a good listener. I was taking in a lot of pain through for whatever reason was focused on the left ear. I don't know why, but it felt like everything was coming in through the left ear. And it said, yeah, there are times where you don't listen well today, but naturally you are. And it's because you are that you had to shut down that gift. You had to forget it. So I'm here to remind you that you still have that. And the way it works is when someone is talking, they're talking from, you had mentioned, you talk from the heart. Not everyone talks from the heart, but some people do. And oftentimes, even people who don't, sometimes they do. So when someone is speaking from their heart, then a channel is created from their heart to their mouth, through your ear to your heart. And letting that flow, you can start connecting. We're not listening with our ears. We're listening more with our bodies. And the ear is the channel, the canal, which the energy from their heart now is coming into you because in ayahuasca you connect very much to 
um, the energies of everything. So while you were speaking, there were twice where I felt that land deep within me. And one was where you said that, like, we're not here for fun. We're here to do a specific mission. And the other was where you said that when you went in the cars, the three cars, the woman, remind me her name? Iman Lisbon. Iman Lisbon. She went with you. She understood, right? I mean, we're, we're sitting here in my home. We live in America. There's a comfort. And in the comfort, we forget that sometimes there's something worth fighting for. And it's okay to go, like, to sacrifice our comfort for that. And her probably not having had that experience of that comfort didn't forget that lesson, that when someone is in trouble, we go, we go 100%. And, and that was what spoke to me um, the loudest was how quickly she was to jump in uh, for you. And for me, it's a cool opportunity to be able to sit with you and partner with you in some ways by saying, okay, you're jumping in and you're, you're doing that. Right? You're saying that, hey, I, even, I haven't even ruled out the possibility of going back to Nigeria because there are people out there who are struggling, who are my brothers, and I can go in and help them. And then this woman in this story did the same thing. And like you said, stayed longer than you did. It sent something in my heart, up my spine. I feel it. And hopefully I'm changed by it myself to be a little bit more willing to go out of my own comfort to help those who are, uh, are needing it. So thank you, Rudy. Thank you for sitting down. I hope your uh, docu-series changes the world. Love this show. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing that.